Welcome, everyone. Today is Thursday, May 26, and this is the Arlington School Committee. Um, before we begin, I'd like to um, introduce a moment of silence for John Bean, who recently died. Uh, Mr. Bean retired from Arlington after serving for many years as the Director of Public Works in Arlington, and I've heard um, many people talk about stories about him, um, that he was a a strong presence in town. He was a dedicated public servant who cared deeply about his work in Arlington. Our condolences to his family. Moment of silence, please. Okay. Um, so before, um, first we're going to go talk about the artwork and then we'll move on to um, public participation. So, which are now out of order. So starting from this side, and I have to tell you, these are pictures. You don't see sort of the full beauty of the um, three-dimensional form. Um, we have ceramic sculpture from grade five. Uh, fifth grade students first discuss, discuss the concept of the enchanted forest as a fictitious landscape that often featured in old stories, particularly fairy tales, and how such stories contain elements of magic and transformation. Students were then shown several examples of the work of contemporary glass artist Dale Chihuly and discuss the abstracted botanical quality of his work. Hmm. Chihuly creates pieces that are often derived inspiration from nature while representing forms that are at once alien yet familiar. Students were instructed to plan and design a clay sculpture that could connote the idea of some form of plant life under an enchanted transformation. Scul sculptures were constructed from fired pottery clay and later glazed. But students were also encouraged to plan for incorporating additional materials to include later, once all previous steps were completed. And uh, in that section two, in a smaller subsection, is uh, grade one paper sculptures. Um, students in grade one were shown several examples of contemporary sculpture inspired by nature. They discussed the artist's choice of materials as well as a form, use of form and scale to create something that did not, did not mimic nature, but rather suggested its influence and allowed the viewer to impart their own interpretation. Uh, students discussed the content of the enchanted forest as a fictitious landscape, often featured in old stories. Um, they were instructed in basic principles of paper sculpture and manipulation of a variety of materials used to suggest the idea of an enchanted toadstool, a common resident of the damp far forest. So that is over there. So these are uh, toadstools. Uh, moving on to here, uh, grade two, uh, fairy village. Students were guided through a discussion about the element of form and how it differs from the element of shape. They were then shown and asked to identify examples of three-dimensional geometric forms. Um, and they discussed how these forms can be seen and recognized in examples of sculpture. They then discussed the concept of the enchanted forest as a fictitious landscape. And they were shown illustrations of several examples of different fairies, such as the pixie, from the book Fairies by Brian Frond and Alan Lee. And they were led to notice how different in appearance each of these creatures were, and asked to consider what kind of house such a fairy might live in. They then um, created their own houses from fired clay, and were required to consider style of the house and to construct it from hollow geometric forms. They were then painted with watercolor paint and embellished with natural materials of the students' choosing. Okay, moving on back, that's a three-dimensional sort of paper sculpture. Uh, students were introduced, this is a third grade, mythical uh, menagerie. Students were introduced to this lesson with a discussion about the sculptures of famous hybrid animals, such as the great sinks of Giza, in Giza, Egypt. People have heard legendary stories about magical combinations animals since the ancient times, and such mythical creatures continue to inspire writers and artists today. Uh, they then discussed the concept of the enchanted forest, and they were instructed to create a hybrid animal of their own, designed from construction paper using basic collage principles. In addition, students were instructed to include pop-up elements to create the illusion of background, middle ground, and foreground more effectively. They were encouraged to consider what they felt would be an interesting or appropriate environment for their animal to live, and whether it be re a realistic or an enchanted habitat. Uh, moving on to this uh, large scale uh, thing, um, grade four, this is a fairy tale silhouette, large scale paper wall murals. The student began this lesson with a discussion of what the enchanted forest is. Uh, they were then compared two very different artists' interpretations of the enchanted forest, one pleasant and delightful, the other mysterious and foreboding. 
Uh, they were then given a brief history of the art of silhouettes, which originated as an 18th century paper craft, and shown how artists of all eras have since adopted the art form in a variety of media. Uh, they were then assigned to groups and instructed to work as a team to construct a large-scale wall, wall mural depicting a scene of the fairy tale and or capturing the mood and essence of an enchanted forest. Each team member was required to contribute at least one element within the piece because the forest plays a key role, each mural was rec required to include at least one tree. So that was cool. And over here, kindergarten, uh, bewitched butterflies, uh, mixed media collage. Kindergarten students were first shown the work of found object sculptor Melissa uh, Steitzlein, whose large scale butterfly sculptures defy expectations with their size and materials. Students were quick to notice the intricate butterfly bodies and wings were comprised of found scrap metal, furniture, glass, and plastic, while still maintaining the colorful uniqueness of real butterfly species. They were also shown the work of Paul Vilinsky, who creates delicate butterflies cut from scrap aluminum and soda cans and arranges them into larger, whimsical inst installations. Um, while being encouraged to consider that all butterflies come in a variety of sizes, shapes, colors, and markings, Students were instructed to create their own butterfly and to plan and allow for deviations as their butterflies were to be enchanted and transformed. Uh, okay, thank you very much. Uh, is there public participation? Great. Okay. Timur, young time. Good evening. I'm Timur Yantar, uh, Bates Road, Precinct 7, and Thompson Parent. Uh, first, I want to offer my congratulations to you all for yesterday's terrific news that the MSBA has uh, invited Arlington High School into the eligibility, eligibility period for the rebuild. So great news, well done. Second, I wanted to express my excitement um, about all that's been happening on so many levels uh, in recent weeks regarding our school's challenges. Uh, this includes the work done by this committee and the administration, and at the uh, forum that was held on Tuesday, and also the work done by the Board of, of Selectmen, the task force, um, other committees, and a town meeting. Uh, clearly, we, we still have a lot of work that's yet to be done. Um, and so my third point tonight is to offer some encouragement, and I hope even some inspiration. I have a brief deck of slides, which I will hold up, and then I'll pass out copies afterward. So slide number one. This is New York City in 1930, an excavated site at the corner of, 50, uh, sorry, of 34th Street and 5th Avenue. Why should you care? <laughs> because of what happened to it, what, what it became in 1931. Slide two, the Empire State Building. 102 stories, tallest building in the world, built in 13 months, ahead of, ahead of schedule. <laughs> <laughs> And, and under budget. <laughs> now, let's move forward to the present day. Slide three. This is the Gibbs School. <laughs> and pending funding, this will be renovated and will reopen as a public school in fall 2018. Now, let's see what the Gibbs School will look like when renovations start. Now, let's see what the Gibbs School will look like when renovations start. Slide four. This is the Gibbs in July 2017. Of course, this is an artist rendition. <laughs> and then let's see what the Gibbs will look like when renovations are completed. Here's slide five. Gibbs, September <laughs> 2018. So wh what's my point? As Rosie the Riveter said, we can do it. And I, I hope that if, if any of you ever waver in your belief that the Gibbs project can be completed on time, Please remember that if a 102-story building can be constructed on a vacant lot in 13 months, surely we can convert a three-story school into a three-story school in 14 months. <laughs> and as Nelson Mandela once said, it always seems impossible until it is done. So good luck. Please let us know how we, the parents, can help. And thank you. Awesome. And I have copies. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I like that. Thank you. Okay. Uh, great. 
Uh, so now I would like to actually, I'd like to, um, to uh, introduce our AHS student representative um, who attended Day in the Hill, which is a, um, a thing we go to Beacon Hill to talk to our legislators, to advocate for school funding, for other issues. And um, please introduce yourself and, and tell us about your experience. Oh, actually, we need, a, we need to speak into the microphone. Thank you. I'm Danny Hallis. I'm a senior here at Arlington High School. Mm -hmm. um, and I went to Day on the Hill a few weeks ago. And it was definitely very informative. Um, I think a lot of the stuff was very uh, like complex, a lot about budgets and the Common Core charter schools. But I definitely learned a lot of new things, very um, interesting things. And Representative Garbley definitely helped us out a lot through that. He explained a lot to myself and the other members of the student council that went along with us. Um, yeah, it was a very fun day. Um, any um, particular issues that you want to bring to our attention or to legislators attention? Um, no, I, I don't believe so. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Well, great. Thanks. Um, I just think comment. Yes. Um, I just want to say how, how well you represented Arlington and Arlington High School. They asked great questions. They were so interested in what was going on, and um, I wanted to let you know how impressed uh, Representative Garbley was um, with the questions and just your your interest. And it was it was a lot to take in in one day, but um, you did a wonderful job. Thank you. And I hope you continue uh, to think about ways that you can be involved in politics and issues as we go forward. And that was one of the things that was his message as well. He told them how young he was when he got elected and was encouraged them to think about it themselves. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Future school committee member, future legislator. <laughs> Great. Um, I just want to recognize uh, Liz Higgins, who is our AEA rep today. Thank you. Um, okay, so the next on the agenda is uh, Matt Coleman, who's going to talk to us about, uh, give us sort of an overview of what's been happening in the math department and where we're going to from here. So as the slides are coming down, I just wanted to thank you for, uh, for having me. Um, it is always nice to, to present in front of you guys. So um, pretty much the goal, uh, and I know you guys have seen the slides, and uh, I'm going to talk through some of the, I would say, finer details. Uh, the goal pretty much is to kind of give you an overview of what has happened in the last four years. Um, you know, it's hard to believe that it has been four years. Uh, and some of the things that I'd hope to work on, and hopefully we can talk about some of the, uh, uh, I guess, different aspects and different things I'll be asking of, of Dr. Chesson, Dr. Bodie, you know, all of you guys, and of the department as well. Um, although this is a presentation, and it's in a presentation format, I encourage you to ask questions throughout. If something kind of strikes you, feel free to ask. That's fine. I know the last slide refers to questions, and I'll take some then as well, but if something does strike you, feel free to ask. So, um, I'll talk about is it, uh, a replacement lamp. Replacement lamp. Oh, you just have to. Hit the okay. eternal problem. You need to hit OK. okay What's that? <laughs> you need to hit OK. On the computer, probably. Computer. Um, I no. I think it's on. There we go. All right. There we go. We're all Excellent. set. Of course. As soon as everybody runs out, yeah. they get scared. We're good. All right. So, uh, just to give you a little history. Uh, it's not like I've been here forever. It's really only been four years, but started in June 2012. Uh, lucky enough to, to be offered the job. Um, I started pretty much right away. You know, it was one of those things where at that time, I want to say the uh, sixth grade team may have been attending some workshops at EDCO, and I had, uh, joined them. And there were all these other little things happening. During the summer that year, there was also some elementary PD. I had a chance to do that. I spent a lot of the summer uh, cleaning, organizing, trying to wrap my head around what the job would be, uh, meeting with a lot of you guys, meeting with a lot of community members. It was awesome. It was really, really good. Uh, September, when that started, pretty much I had spent as much time as I could in classrooms. 
Um, I, you know, fully admit at the beginning it was more time in the middle schools and high schools because of the fact that I think there was a lot of work to be done there and I think there's been a lot of good stuff that's happened. Uh, and at that time I was pretty much analyzing as much data as I could. You know, my goal at that point was really just trying to get a sense of what I can accomplish in the short term and then what would be done over the next couple of years. Um, so some of the big things, and I don't know if you guys remember back that first year, but these were some of the big things that I would say drive, drove my thought uh, as to where we are right now. Uh, it really struck me as being really interesting that my first year here, there was only 76% of the seniors taking a math class. That really stuck with me. I thought that was kind of interesting uh, in this town. Uh, there was only one math science specialist in all of K through five. Um, you know, my predecessor was part time and there was that one, one person working with that. Um, in this school, and this kind of refers back to, I think, point number one, we only had two sections of AP Calc AB, which I don't want to say one is better than the other, but that's the AP Calc that's basically one semester. And that was the only AP course we offered at the high school level, which was kind of interesting. We had no computer science at the high school. Uh, the middle school teachers were using curriculum from 2011, uh, 2000, 2000, which didn't take into account that there was a standard shift in 2004 and in 2011. <laughs> so this was a little antiquated. Um, and at the elementary level, I would say it was inconsistent. You know, it was one of those things where at the time, I think we had, um, you know, uh, just different resources allocated at different places. Uh, in spite of all these things, these are big things I noticed, things were going well, they were going good, but it really kind of gave me a little bit of a focus of what was going to happen. So the past four years, this is pretty much what I focused on. And in my mind, I always chunked it as, um, you know, K through five initiatives, six through eight initiatives, and, and high school initiatives. At the elementary level, really kind of my big focus uh, was trying to get an infrastructure in that could really start to focus on curriculum and instruction at the elementary level. Um, in terms of getting a lot more resources, that was going to be a tough sell at the beginning. I don't know if you guys remember at 2012, new standards came in at 2011. A lot of the textbook distributors at that time rearranged what their content was. They slapped on the Common Core sticker and then they resold it as something that was brand new. It really didn't meet what we needed. So at that time, my decision and what we kind of went for was, let's attack more of the curriculum instruction aspect of it. Let's try to support the teachers. Let's try to get something a little bit more in there and kind of wait out until we felt as though the better curriculum content or something that was more in line with what we wanted, both in practice and content was there. And in the meantime, we also had some uh, digital, I would say technological improvements throughout the district. So incorporating something that was a little bit more tech savvy was something that was good as well. So that took a little bit of patience. That's that bullet point number two. Um, that's where we're kind of starting right now. You know, in the background, I always wanted to kind of refresh that K through five curriculum uh, because it was chunked. It was kind of a, a, a Franken curriculum. Is that a good way to say it? Uh, so it was one of those things where we definitely needed refreshing, but we needed to wait a little bit. So initially, it really was about that, that um, just that support. Like, how do we actually get it so we could have consistent professional development in the summertime, consistent people to go to for questions, someone who could be in classes a little more frequently to see what's happening. Um, you know, I have a lot of energy and I try to pride myself on being a lot of places. I don't think I could have been in nine places at once. So it's been great to have those other resources uh, to help me out. At the middle school, um, you know, this was one of those things where uh, there were some pretty clear needs with restructuring our math support program at that time. Um, we had two teachers who were in charge of working with a lot of students who were struggling across all grades. Um, at that time, they were structured in a way that it was, it was tough to really meet the needs of everybody, so we restructured a little bit there. And we really tried to foster a relationship with special ed that's continuing to, write, to be write, done right now. Um, we had a lot of students at that time also who were looking for other opportunities for advancement. Um, I would never say that I've actually uh, solved the, all the problems that we have, but the bypassing option has been a pretty good solution for some of our students right now. Um, curriculum update. Luckily enough, uh, the folks who wrote CMP, uh, P, uh, Connected Math, they were a little bit ahead of curve with the updating of their curriculum. So it was one of those things when we shifted over to CMP3, we were able to actually do that in year two and year three of my time. We're at full implementation right now. I think it's been a great sell uh, for the teachers. They've really bought in. I think it was one of those things that at the time we needed a refresher and it's, it's done uh, a good job for them. Um, first year here also, and this was a big goal, um, a lot of times it's not rocket science, um, and this was definitely, you know, I have to thank Laura and Kathy for doing this. Getting release time, like full day release time with teachers, my first year and second year, just to sit down and look at the standards, plan, kind of reset calibration. It was one of those things where in the first two years we did a lot of that, and it was awesome. 
Um, the other thing is we really at that time I also saw a huge need for computer science in the middle school. Nothing at the high school, wasn't anything at the middle school, but there was this little nook class called DCL, Digital Citizenship and Literacy at that time, which covered some good stuff, but it was uh, definitely a place where we can kind of change some stuff. And at that time, I know there's some percentages throughout this, that, that class was uh, mandatory, but it essentially covered 76% of the kids who were in sixth grade. Um, AHS, uh, you know, I already kind of alluded to some of the things that were, were um, areas that I wanted to kind of work in there. That's all up here. Um, creating new cost offerings was big. That kind of lends itself to the fact that we only had 76% of the seniors. We had to figure out more pathways, more, more ways for our students to access with actually uh, the content and different pathways. So I really focused on those, those um, higher level classes and the lower level classes. I kind of tackled and went after the extremes uh, to see if we can make some inroads there. We built a CS program, that was a big thing. Um, another big part at the high school was that uh, the, at that time there were 11 high school math teachers, five had over 128 students. Uh, at that time the math department in the high school was, there was a lot of teachers who had a lot of students, a lot of students, uh, and that was over. I want to say the, the high that year was 136 for one teacher, uh, it was a lot. Um, and uh, I needed to figure out ways to get a little bit more common planning time for those teachers. This is amazing, and I still to this day can't imagine this. My first year here, no single math teacher in the high school had a common planning time with a teacher who saw, taught the same level of the same course. I don't think if you tried to schedule that, that would happen. <laughs> I was amazed by that. I thought that was one of the most amazing things I had seen. So it was really tough for us to get a lot of uh, uh, kind of conversation. So current state, you know, that was a quick little overview. Any, any questions uh, for, for all that stuff? Those are the big things CM that I saw. How's CMP going in the middle school? I think it's going well. You know, it's one of the things where um, they're at that point right now, since we're in about year two, year three, yeah. teachers are now starting to make their own adjustments because they feel more comfortable. You know, whenever you initially adopt it, when you make those changes, you may not understand the ripple effect yeah. until it's too late. So that first year, I asked for 100% fidelity. Yep. Year two, you make your minor adjustments. Now that we're in year three, there's some ownership. There's some more thoughtful changes. Yep. There are some other little aspects that are being modified. And I think it's now becoming more Arlington curriculum as opposed to CMP3, which is nice. But it takes time. You know, you, yeah, yeah. It's a, what's also good is it's a form of PD for the teachers as well. They have to lend themselves to, to trying something a little different, trying something new. Because of the program, you know, our eighth grade team chose collaboration and discourse as their goals to work on for this year because it really dovetailed in nicely with what uh, and how the content was actually delivered. And it's been great. You know, some of the things that I've seen in the class, both in terms of the content and the conversations, has been really good. I would really, um, we're also using that in Lexington. Yeah. And this is our second year yep. of implementation. Um, and I'm trying to get together a couple of districts. Let's that do it. might want to work together yep. to make some of those modifications because I've seen some good ones and I feel like I want to share. Some there's, of those. there's, we should talk because there's another local district that's going to make the change for next year too. Oh, good. So right. we, we could All definitely right. talk. Um, so now, I mean, this is great. We have six math coaches. You know, over three years, we've been able to build that up, and it's been awesome. Um, I can't tell you how invaluable they are to me. Uh, they're, they're great. Um, they really are, are great. I'm lucky to work with them. And still there is this focus on curriculum instruction, professional development, because we were waiting out kind of the, the movement towards a new curriculum. Uh, the curriculum visions, this is kind of the big one for us for the next couple of years. Um, we are going to adopt the new Investigations 3.0, um, and that's going to start next year, so I'll touch on that in a little bit. Um, we revised the progress reports. Uh, finally, they they're actually match the current standards and match all the, the initial stuff. And these all sound like such like simple little things, but it takes time, it takes work, it takes a lot of meeting with teachers and, and figuring out the best way to go about it. Um, and right now, we're kind of in the midst of restructuring what I would call our Tier 2 and Tier 3, our kind of secondary supports for some of our struggling learners and in some instances just other, other students who might need a little bit of help. Uh, the coaches satisfy what I would call kind of tier one support, which is that curriculum, that instruction part, but we really need to kind of start to focus on what happens for some of those um, groups of students who might be struggling and or individual students who need a little bit more. We still haven't built that up as much as we can. I mean, yes, Mr. Hanna. The, the second line on the slide begs the question, six equals seven. Uh, are there any plans to have another one? Yeah, you know, to, to add even more math, it's, it's 5.0 FTE for six coaches for okay. seven schools. Yeah, okay. so they're not even all full-time. So yeah, I, I, 
you know, I always have my grand plans, but, you know, it, it would be one of those things where I would love it if we had a one-to-one -one correspondence. I guess <laughs> I was looking to the question up here, less to you uh, for the future. <laughs> Oh, when we get to the slide about what, I'm, what, what I see right. for the future, right. we'll talk about that. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> What's that? Yeah, yeah, please, please, yes. Um, so that, that's Kubernetes' current state. Current state of OMS, we're, we're fully implemented with CMP3. It, it's going well. Um, we're definitely in live with movements, what I think is good, which is much more collaborative-based classrooms, much more conversation, a little more ownership of the, the, the knowledge. Um, and teachers are really starting to be thoughtful about the ways in which they're asking questions, um, which is nice. And I would say this also, the infusion of some of the technologically, uh, technology that we've had in sixth grade has also helped with that. It's shifted the way in which some of the kids can uh, communicate. DCL, which I talked about before, which was 76% of enrollment, now we've renamed as DML, Digital Media and Literacy, and essentially that course is now, uh, we're supporting 88% of the kids, which, you know, considering that the cohorts of kids are actually growing larger, we're, we're working with a lot more kids now uh, with the same FTEs that we had before, but now the citizenship aspect is the secondary goal. We do a lot more, I would say, robust units that are all focusing on design, algorithm thinking, um, you know, good project-based things that kids are doing in Scratch, HTML, uh, at the sixth grade level, uh, which is awesome. Um, it's, it's hard to get that in the middle school, and the fact that we found some real estate in sixth grade is awesome. Mm -hmm. uh, math support, uh, talked about a little about the structure, and we were able to get it so now that we have one math support teacher per grade, one that's dedicated to six, one to seven, one to eight, which has been invaluable to me as well. It's increased our ability to actually um, uh, almost read and react with some students a little bit more. Before we'd populate our classes and there wasn't a whole lot of room for movement, now I could actually start with a lower uh, student enrollment and actually grow throughout the year, which is good. Um, another okay. thing that the math support teacher does, I gotta say this, if you guys ever go to the middle school and you see your friendly math support teacher, please thank them. <laughs> they have a hard, hard job. They do great work. They also co-teach our sub-separate uh, math classes with the special educator, and all three of them also have other obligations. Julie McDaniel in sixth grade teaches the independent study in geometry. Shukti uh, Fischl does some work in kind of outreach with ELL. And then Jeff Melton, because of the fact that there was a higher enrollment in eighth grade, actually teaches a section of Math 8 to actually help balance out the sections. So for a lot of those uh, teachers, all three of them, they're, they have three or four different preps. They're trying to communicate with multiple teachers. They're doing really great work, really, really great work and really helping out in a lot, a lot of ways. Um, just interrupt, uh, Dr. Allison, if you had a... Um. Yeah. I know we're interested in achievement and assessment of that, but I'm wondering if you're seeing more interest and enthusiasm, because I think that's really important to develop in yeah. kids, too. Um, yeah. You know, I, I would say that also goes in conjunction, and I put it in the slides, but I have to kind of definitely, definitely tout the work that uh, John McIntyre has done with the middle school math club. Um, there's a lot more opportunities. There's a lot more things for kids to do. And, and when I go through the classrooms, kids are happy. They're doing math. They're, they're working. Um, you know, it's, it's oftentimes when you walk in, kids will ask me questions. I don't see many, I don't see many dour faces. I don't see many kids who are not I wouldn't say kids are jumping off the, the rafters having like the greatest time in the world, but um, there is, yeah, enthusiasm. Um, yeah, definitely is. Um, and then the bypassing. You know, I kind of uh, treaded uh, lightly with the bypassing because if you don't have the full-fledged geometry class, mm -hmm. oftentimes it's a race to nowhere. So now we bypass sixth grade. We actually have a fully formed uh, geometry class that actually matches the same geometry class that we have at the high school. One of the great things about uh, Julie McDaniel is that she taught in the high school. She has a good working relationship with the teachers here. They share content. They're at the same place. Uh, I feel pretty good about the fact that those students in those courses are you know, receiving a pretty good education uh, in terms of the math. Um, those students. Sorry, technical oh, sorry. problems. Yeah. <laughs> there you go. You got the green light? Uh, those students uh, going inside there, there's seven kids inside that class. That class is awesome. Uh, th those kids are so excited about the math they're doing. Um, they've done some really, really good stuff. Really good stuff. Uh, current state of the high school. If there is one thing I'm probably the most proud of, it's probably that first thing. Before, 76% of seniors. Uh, I double checked this again last week to make sure I was right. It's 97% of seniors now. Um, we're virtually at 99 percent of all kids taking a math class across the board 
And the, I think one of the greatest stats also is that if you look at capacity of the math department right now in the high school against enrollment, we're actually at 111%. Because we have kids that are doing uh, two classes at the same time, they're taking computer science, they're doing a lot of other stuff. It's pretty ridiculous, it's pretty amazing. And I attribute that all to the work of the, the math teachers. I mean, they're not only you know, putting these courses in, they're making these courses, I think, worthwhile and fun. I don't know if that answers a little bit about the enthusiasm as well. Like the, Kids are coming back to the math classes. Kids are coming back and they're saying, and that's really kind of, I would say, helped out. Um, you know, we've definitely had an increase in staffing, which we've needed to kind of take, take some of that on, and it's been great. Uh, I know little talked a little about computer science this morning. Uh, my first year, no computer science. Uh, we have 93 kids currently this year uh, across four, five sections, and right now we have about 104 kids signed up for next year and enrollment hasn't stopped, um, which, is, which is great. Kids are accessing that class. Um, in terms of the increasing staffing, that's been a huge help. Right now, the staffing, the kind of the per pupil, um, you know, average that a teacher has, it's more in line with the, the rest of the school, which I feel good about. Um, and since I'm a numbers person, I, I pay a lot of attention to standard deviation and variance and make sure that things are balanced. I said before about the, the number of teachers who had over 126, was it, 128 students? Now the highest uh, that anybody has is 124, and that's the highest, uh, which is good. It's a lo lot more manageable. Uh, the teachers are appreciative of the fact that they're not overwhelmed. Um, everyone is taking over ownership over the education, which is great. It's really good. Goals moving forward. So I just kind of chucked this in three things. I'll have a couple slides up here to kind of reinforce what it is. Um, it's at that point right now, it sounds kind of weird, but you know, year one, year two, I was reading and reacting to, I would say, what was here before. Year three and year four, I really feel like this is, you know, my department now. You know, this is one of those things where I want to set the tone. I have a better handle of all the, the stats. I have a better handle of what we're doing moving forward. So these would be the big things going forward for me. Um, we've done a good development, still work to do, of that coaching team. We have a three-year plan for the infusion of a new curriculum. So I feel in the next, over that seven years, we have a good plan for curriculum instruction with a little bit of um, an enhance, enhancement in the assessment. What we have to start to do is actually build more of a robust program that is that tier two, tier three part. We need to be able to now start to find that time within a school day. Uh, we have to find um, you know, possibly those assessments that are gonna inform us of, of these individual things that we could do with students. And then we actually have to start to hire some staff. Right now it's um, you know, not where I'd want it to be, but the way I envision it, I think before you were talking about what I'd like to see, I do want to see a coach at every school, and I do want to see a student interventionist in a school. Like what I'd like to see is that team, that cooperation of someone who's going to be working with teachers, with instruction, with the, the content, and then someone who's going to be working together with the principal who will be focused on individual students if they need to be pulled or small groups. And when, in my vision, it's also a good relationship with special education as well. Like to me, that seems to make sense. It seems to be that we can actually accomplish a lot. I have no illusion that I'll be able to get 14 staff members over the next couple <laughs> of years, so I'm fine with treading, treading you know, slowly. So you know, one of the things you'll see is how do we start to actually work with those students? So when I see these high need students, I see it starting in kindergarten, going all the way up, and I want to make sure we have a pretty comprehensive program to actually work with these students. Um, at OMS, uh, oddly enough, you know, I said before about all the good things that are happening in math support, I still think we can fine tune it and do it a little bit better. Um, you know, right now we're echoing the main curriculum that we do, but the reality is I like to start to, to work with students on more of an individual basis if we can and find a secondary curriculum that can actually uh, help uh, supplement some of what we're doing. Um, in terms of OMS and uh, AHS, this kind of goes together. We also have to kind of figure out a better way to meet the, the varying needs of a lot of our students. You know, we're working with social, emotional, uh, sometimes we're working with cognitive, we're working behavioral. So how do we actually take those math support resources to create a more diverse um, support system or offering for all of these students? And in AHS, um, the restructure in the math special I just kind of, I just alluded to, uh, we're pretty much, Dan, Dan Sheldon and I, the computer science teacher, we talk pretty regularly about what we want to see happen. Um, and this kind of ties into the last, the ultimate one. I want to start to increase some more math offerings, and I want to do it in a way we can offer some half-year electives because of the fact that I like to start to see more kids take the chance to, to try out some of these classes. Right now, with all of our classes, we're at 
and it's amazing, but kids are, are committing themselves to full year classes. So I could see us in the CS department start to consider half year electives. I could see us putting in courses such as linear algebra that can be accessed um, after an algebra two background for the most part, and it could be a half year course for some students to take something like a number theory. All this has to be done in conjunction with staffing, uh, and that's one of the things we, you know, I always work on is bringing in you know, good people who can, who can teach these classes. But really what I want to start to do is to round out um, the department to not just have these core Algebra 1, Geometry, Algebra 2 pathways with the standard capstone courses, but to offer something that's a little bit more, um, you know, when you get to college and realize math is a lot more than just calc, uh, I want to offer some uh, glimpse into that. And I'd like to start to make some connections with other stuff. But for the most part, that's, that's kind of what we're looking for. Little things, was that the end? That's it. Oh, well, there we go, okay. Yep. Yeah. Any questions? Great, thank you. <clears throat> Matt, can I just emphasize? Please. There was something you skipped over, and that is the need to build CS courses. Oh yeah, sorry, thank you. Yes, middle school. I really, really would love to get seventh and eighth grade computer science. That's going to take a little bit of work with both staffing and also kind of massaging the schedule and figuring out how to actually make that work. It's not as easy as it sounds. There are a lot of obstacles, but that's one of those things where I'll be pushing for the next couple of years. How do I actually get it to be a six through 12 uh, good cohesive pathway? Mr. Thielen. So thank you, Matt. Good presentation. As always, uh, my question is uh, if, you know, we might not be able to do all of this uh, budget. No, yeah, yeah, yeah. <clears throat> so, but it's a but goal, right? It's a goal, yeah. <laughs> so, is, yeah, it's a, that's right. So, as a goal, what would be your priorities? You know, if you were to go to Dr. Bodie and say, "This is what I want to do in FY 18," what would you? You don't have to. You don't have to commit to it right now, but yeah, yeah. Kind of in this, what are your what are your kind of top priorities here? Um, you know, it's it's tough for me to answer because, like I said before, I think about it as K through five, six through eight, yep. and if I say any one, it might diminish the others. Uh, I would say probably that the, the top part right now would be really working with K through five, getting the coaches, getting the interventionists, getting yep. the curriculum solidly in there would probably be priority number one because I think that would pay dividends for all grades yep. eventually at some point. So that would probably be uh, yeah item number one. Um, uh, you know. I, I could always I, I, I always try to be creative with with uh, staffing and, and enrollment at the other grades. Uh, yeah, so I'd probably say the, the elementary stuff. Thank you. No problem. Yes, Mr. Hanner. Thank you again for a phenomenal presentation. My only concern with all these extra courses and 111 yeah. percent is the emotional issue and the yeah. pressure on the kids. Uh, are you you and your teachers involved in basically evaluating how much kids are doing? I know. Uh, um, like overall with everything? Well, the idea, I mean, you, you mentioned that several, some students are taking more than one math course at yeah. a time. Yeah. Uh, and AP, other AP courses and things of that nature, they may be taking that aren't math related. I'm just concerned that departments are isolated, that there's not this uh, coordination to all of a sudden realize that you got a student taking like three or four AP courses at once. So. I'll tell you this, guidance has done a pretty good job of monitoring that. They, they often look at that. They often are advising kids, I think, in a pretty thoughtful way. I don't think we can grow much past 111%, because after a while, it's, it's, there's almost a cannibalization. You know, the, the reality is our, our CS numbers jumped up, but our CAD numbers went down. You know, there's only so many sections and so many things to do. Um, what, what, what I kind of view it as is I want to give kids some opportunity to take some classes. I by no means believe that would go to 120%. What I believe is that the courses would just be distributed differently. You know, it, it's great for me to see that a lot of our kids didn't choose Calc as their, you know, their through thread. They're choosing the AP Stats course because a lot of times that's more transferable to what they might do in the future. Mm -hmm. So I don't, I don't think there's going to be. I hope. I don't, I don't mean this to intend that there's going to be kids taking four or five math classes. I just want to give them the opportunity to take a course if they want, and then you know, for me to staff it appropriately, fully knowing that enrollment for another course would go down. I want to make it clear. I am excited about all the offerings that you're offering, and the more that you go, I think it's an exciting thing yeah. to, to give students the multiple choices. And just the idea of calculus, I don't know how many people that aren't math majors or sci very heavy science majors, the, uh, the stats course is something all of us can use. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, 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 they're, they're good courses. They're good courses. Thank and they, they speak well to each other. Computer science and stats, I mean, that's an avenue where I'd like to see a little more integration because at this point they are so interrelated. Great. Thank you. Ms. Starks. Um, 
I'm really excited about the computer science um, at my daughter's uh, graduation this year. Uh, the keynote speaker was the woman who founded Girls Who Code. Yeah. Um, and she was unbelievable. And she got up there and said that the number one job, we are about to have a shortage of programmers. Um, and not only her goal is not only to make the United States the number one supplier, but she is going to do it by getting girls yeah. to code. Um, and it's, it was fascinating, and she was unbelievable. And then yesterday, I attended a summit, and um, the keynote speaker was Kathy Fosnett. And she was talking about how the number one important thing that they have found that kids need going into kindergarten and starting early is early numeracy, the most important thing, even more important than reading and literacy, because if they have the math, the reading comes easier, mm -hmm. and that is the number one indicator. And I was just like, oh, this makes me so excited to be a teacher right now. Like, look at us. We've got to get to these. I people. agree with everything you just said. Uh, <laughs> Kathy Fosno is fantastic. No, it is. I mean, it's, um, yeah, it's great. You know, it's, it really is. Early, any type of early intervention and, and doing things well at the early grades really, really does pay dividends long term. Yeah. Uh, that, that definitely is one of my hopes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, good. Congratulations. Thank you so much. Thank I want to, yeah, saying this also, everything we talked about, everything that's happened was money and resources. Like, for me, it's thank you to you guys. You know, th this is one of those things where I do appreciate the trust that you guys had in terms of the teachers, myself, and building all of this because, you know, it's, it's an investment, and I think we're getting stuff out of our investment right now. We are seeing some improvements. It's what we do now. Like, I actually think, I was talking to my wife about this uh, a couple nights ago, I actually think my job for the next couple of years is going to be harder than the first couple of years because now we're talking about fine-tuning. We're talking about trying to be much more creative. Like these are big, broad-stroke, you know, changes that you can do uh, with some investment, some some personnel. It's it's about to get a lot harder, um, and that's that's good. That's all right. Thank you. Yes, Dr. Allison Abbey. I'm trying to remember the name of the program. I think it's Plato that we have done for enrichment for students who are having achievement problems or something in math, and I'm wondering. I don't even know if this comes under your department per se. Special ed use that a lot. Right. Yeah. Do you work with them at all? I'm wondering if it's helpful or not from so, your pers in your perspective. Yeah, they, there are so many computer programs out there right now that different teachers are using um, you know, at different levels. One of the hard parts for me is corralling it all and understanding what exactly we want to use. Uh, so special ed has used um, Plato. I think there are pros and cons to it. It's a little bit more superficial. Uh, it's it's good as the resource it's used for. Um, I would say it's like kind of a tier two, tier three resource as long as there's, you know, a staff member who's also working with the student as well. It's good practice. Um, you know, there's there are other things throughout. Um, you know, I've, it'll be a long conversation. I could tell you different things that are happening at different levels. Um, but yeah, for the most part, I, I would say that's primarily used by special ed. Um, Mr. Cardin. Uh, thank you, a great presentation. Um, so as, as we talk about adding more you know, math support, you know, we've added you know, over the probably last five or 10 years, we've added reading support, we've added social workers, we've added these math coaches, literacy coaches, we've added a lot of out of classroom staff. So one way we can do that though is by sort of balancing that against class size. Yep. And so I think we have to have a, a conversation and also educate the parents that yes, class sizes may creep up a little bit, but because we've got some, all this other support, it may not be the end of the world. So I think if we, if we want to push in that direction, yeah. then that's, that's a conversation we have to start having. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I, I have a lot more control over the, the class sizes of the middle school and high school, and I do put a lot of work. You know, Actually, before this, I, I was in my office crunching numbers and trying to figure out the best way to balance everything at the middle school. And I think that's been done pretty well uh, so far. I think it's getting better. Um, but yeah, everything, you know, a lot of times it's a zero sum game, and you just have to figure out what it is that you value, what your goals are, uh, what you want to see as a typical class size. And I, I think a lot of the things you alluded to at the elementary level, what you're okay with, and then how do we actually build the structures around that as well? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's never, it's never easy. Oh, Miss Starks, mm -hmm. I have one more yeah. question. I just remembered. So tonight we vote. Yep. <laughs> Gibbs sixth grade. Yeah. <laughs> or Gibbs six seven eight. Go. My personal feeling, everything that I've talked to for the teachers, um, I, I would say Gibbs sixth grade. Okay. 
uh, I would say. That, that's where I would be leaning towards right now uh, if those were the two choices. Okay. Does that make the intervention easier, more possible in sixth grade? Because now we can play with the schedules. We can mm, find yeah, that time. It's hard to say what the infrastructure will be because you know, it also comes with a restructuring, I would imagine, of staffing and have, right. you know, I'd imagine, before I could answer that, I'd have to see what the restructuring of the staffing would be and what I'd have for resources, and then try to make a plan off of that. I don't know if it would be easier or harder. I can tell you this, I'll do the best I can to figure it out. <laughs> mm -hmm. Great, thank you. Uh, no problem. And I'll just say just a couple things, which is I'm particularly excited about the introduction potentially of linear algebra and the statistics courses um, because from personal experience I know there's a lot of really fun math yep. that is not calculus. <laughs> there is, there is. Just, I mean, there's yeah. a lot of other fun math out there. <laughs> and it's all related, you know, a, a, a real good linear algebra course you really should have some calc. Right. But you could pull off a linear algebra class without it and, and you know, relate it, transfer it to what's happening in some of your science classes and computer science classes which is good. Mm -hmm. uh, Guys, thank you very much. Good. Well, thank you. Thanks, Thanks for so sharing. Much. Thank, Have fun. thank you. So uh, next up is Larry Weathers. He's going to talk to us about science, and I just want to tell you what we're doing, which is that we are, <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, we are, uh, this spring, but also in the fall, trying to get sort of information from each of the departments to sort of get a overview sense of where we've been, where we're going, what our hopes are. And so we've started with history, I think was our first. Yes. Mm -hmm. And um, we will not be finishing up this spring, yes. but uh, we, will, we hope to finish in the fall. Mm -hmm. 2016. <laughs> it's a oh, these are new. Cool. Materials, and, and I wanted to share some of it with you. Um, so I just want to say we, we are a couple minutes ahead, which is great, because we have extra time. Sorry, what? We, we're a couple minutes ahead of our schedule, which is oh, great, so wait? we have extra time. No, um, no. No, 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 but um, but uh, just a, a worry. I know that it usually takes about two minutes per slide, so I know that we'll probably have to rush through some of the slides, but that they are available for the public to look at as well. Okay. Yeah. Um, Okay, so yeah, well, thank you for allowing me to, uh, to share with you some of the, the, uh, the struggles and accomplishments we're going through in our science department. The, uh, sorry, is this a uh, click? Yeah, you have to. Oh, it's over. Uh, these are the, uh, the mission statements of the science department. Now, it ends up that the, the new science standards just came out last month, the formal printing of them. And they almost totally mirror these. And I'm sort of proud to say that we had these before the science standards came out. Ooh. So <laughs> we're, we're interested in, in lifelong learning about being literate science citizens. And, um, and so that's, that's where we're, we're really trying to head. So, um, my colleague from the math department has left, so that's why I inserted this uh, slide <laughs> here. I, wa I wanted you to see, although it, it's, it's not entirely obvious, where is science? It's at the core. If you, <laughs> if, you look at, if you look at the upper left picture, and you can barely see the word science on the left, it's just a little closer to the heavens than math. <laughs> the math is down there, a little further down on the right. And when we nice. demolish this building and rebuild it, we can make consideration. Okay, well, I'm, I'm Don't just, take it for granted. I'm describing this, the current state of affairs. <laughs> uh, and then in, you know, in the vertical view, science is right there in the center. It's connected to every one of those disciplines. It uses math. Science goes on in all the countries of the globe, it uses language, and it's, the history of it is very rich. And, and so I, I, of course, use these pictures tongue in cheek, but um, so the question is, if we're at the core, mm -hmm. which uh, I was positing before, why weren't we at the table? And at, as we have gone through a progression of of regulatory documents from NCLB to ESSA to the new science, technology, and engineering 
frameworks which were just adopted, we have started to move from that back burner to the front burner. We're not all the way there yet, but we've started. Our scores count, not, not to focus totally on test taking. We really want the lifelong learning, but our scores count now. They're part of, they're part of what, what matters in terms of uh, our annual reports and, and how the, the state views us. So we have our new standards that just came out, and what do they look like? Here's an example. Uh, the, the standards are too complicated to look at in a, in a short presentation, but they're composed of two major sections, one called disciplinary core ideas, which are, uh, you know, the areas of each topical discipline of life science, physical science, and earth science. And here's an example from grade three physical science provide evidence to explain the effect of multiple forces, including friction, et cetera. Mm -hmm. And these are all worded as, as what should the student be able to do at the end of a unit that's addressing the standards, their performance standards. And so uh, this is, this is a, a very important part of the new science standards as well as the practices that were added mm -hmm. long ago the inquiry strands were in our early standards back in the early 1990s, and then they slowly got pulled out, and uh, more and more, because of the difficulty of testing them. And so they're back in, and, and they are claiming that they're gonna test them, and we'll, we'll see how that all works. But, but I've seen some very creative questions being developed, and, and so if, if you look at these science and engineering practices, which really are the inquiry skills that kids, uh, w that we're hoping that kids experience, <clears throat> these are the ways scientists work. And I think if you pick through those, you can see that they really totally overlap the ELA and the math practices. The common core is in there mm -hmm. two thirds of the way and the math standards mm -hmm. are, and practices are in there. They're really overlapping. Mm -hmm. And the, so the, the writers of the new science standards were well aware of that. And they, uh, that, that is one of the advantages in the sense of going last in terms of the development of the ELA and math common core standards. And then the next generation science standards came along. But they had the wisdom to know how to incorporate that and overlap with the, with the, mid, with the um, common core. Uh, Massachusetts, of course, always has its own way of doing some educational things, and, and it didn't strictly adopt the NGSS. It, it pushed a few parts aside, but it made a few parts stronger, which included the engineering practices. Mm -hmm. So it, it's, a, it's an expectation that engineering is embedded in all of the science courses. We're not there yet, but we're, we're, we're looking for the ways to do that so that every course will have opportunities for kids to, to look at problems and try to solve those problems and make iterative changes to reach a solution in an engineering kind of process. So uh, embedded within that new uh, framework is this little table on the left. It's called the assumed minutes per day <laughs> to, to reach the standards that, that are expected and that will be tested in about, and it's still being debated when it'll be tested, but it'll be probably about two years, maybe three. So you can see in, in K through two, they're assuming that we're spending two hours per week, three through five, three hours per week, six through eight, 4.5, and, and, and in high school, 5.5. And you can see in the middle column there uh, that we are very shy of that. And this is our anticipated time for next year. In, in prior years, before the standards were developed and before uh, we were on the table in terms of the regulatory things, it was even less than this. And so, so that's one of our challenges is how do we, how do we work with these time deficits? Uh, and again, I, I just cut and pasted that 
table right out of the standards. So one of the things we're doing is we're, we have adopted a new program called FOSS. The, the program itself is not new, but the iteration called the Next Gen Edition is new. It came, it, they were so on top of it, they came out right after the Next Gen was adopted. And, and it's really the best program on the market. These are the topical areas in, in columns of physical science, earth and space science, and, and life science through the, through the uh, five years of elementary school. We have been in our rollout. This current year, we have introduced these kits to grades one, two, and three. And in the coming fall, we will be introducing them to grades four and five. Uh, the, the program is, is research-based. It was developed at the Lawrence Hall of Science and University of California, Berkeley. It, it is it's centered on those two, those two statements there. Science is inherently interesting to kids and they love to play around and muck around in boats and, and, and to explore things. So uh, there's a quote from one of our uh, more experienced elementary school teachers. We're loving the new science kits, very teacher and kid friendly. Uh, she's a veteran teacher and the new teachers are still having trouble with it as they would with any new curriculum. So we're, you know, we're finding where we have gaps, we're finding where we need support, and we're trying to plug those holes. But by and large, it's a really, really rich curriculum. So an example, the motion and matter unit from grade three. The students explore, it's, it's called motion and matter, and they do it through a variety of experiments. They first of all build tops, spin them, you can imagine kids in third grade loving this. Mm -hmm. And then they create new interactions. They, they create an axle with wheel, a wheel on each side, but the wheels are not the same size. Mm -hmm. So it does some strange things. Yeah. And then they start exploring that and eventually have to build cars that are part of an engineering design challenge where the cars have to do certain tricks. They have to turn left and right and end up under ramps and things like that. So, so it's hard to notice where, where science and engineering learning ends and where play begins. Mm -hmm. And that's the great thing about this is that the kids really, really love doing it. Some strong points about the FOSS system is that it's, uh, it's got really high quality supports. It is very language based and I've shown you that the, I just passed around these examples of, of folios and, and student resources. The hardcover book is a reader. And so one of the strategies that we're talking about in terms of how do we get that time to deal with the science that we, we need, we, these informational reading passages are directly uh, part of the science experiments they're doing. And so what we're trying to do is see if there are ways that we can use these as part of an overlap with our ELA informational reading time and thereby gain some time back. Uh, it, it's really, you know, as I said, the, the Common Core overlap is striking. It has a very strong notebooking component. One of the other folios I passed out is all about the philosophy and the, um, the strategies of notebook taking that get kids to read and write and articulate. And uh, it, it has built-in ELL strategies. It's really a 21st century program. Uh, very rich formative assessment and technology resources for the teachers. And teacher prep videos. A teacher can go and, and look at a five minute video of what the lesson is that they have to do a day or two from now and see what it looks like. And you know, we try to give them the prof professional development ahead of time. But uh, for them to go back and be able to review that at home, on their computer, or wherever is, is a real great thing. It uses a lot of language for inquiry. Uh, in, they're consistently involved in writing, in their notebooking, uh, and, and all the other things that it says here. They, they are asked to engage in argumentation based on evidence. and, and um, The research really shows that, that 
when kids learn either from just pure reading or even just from pure experimenting, the, the learning is nowhere near as deep as when they're asked to reflect on it, write about it, and read about it. It's, it's really an integrated approach. Uh, and you can imagine that if a student were to read and write about something, what better than something that's right in front of them or that they saw that day or the day before, a bunch of growing plants, watching why some die and some don't, and, and articulating that it's concrete and it's right there, so it, it really aids in the writing. Um, so with, that, with the pressure from the congested curriculum and, and the uh, lack of enough time for science, science notebooking is a way of, of helping with that. Uh, I think you probably notice where that notebook page on the upper left came from. <laughs> that's that's uh, a page student? out of, <laughs> out of uh, Leonardo da Vinci's yeah, yeah. book. <laughs> Uh, his, note, his lab notebook, okay? And so our kids are starting to do this. You know, you can see a progression there of second, third, and fourth grade, uh, even though this fourth grade example is not from our students because they haven't had this yet. But kids start to articulate in, in the uh, right, bottom right from a fourth grade uh, student, although you can't read it from here, the student was observing plants growing. The teacher posted a sticky and said, where's your evidence? And the kid answers back, my evidence is, mm -hmm. and gives a hypothesis. It may or may not be correct, but it's, it's the start of, of a <coughs> argumentation from evidence. And so we, we hope that notebooking is gonna be a very strong part of this program. And we get to the Otteson Middle School. Yeah. <laughs> now this, this cartoon was obviously meant for a different kind of sandwiching, but I think the, um, the middle school was sandwiched for a while because when the Common Core came out, the NGSS got delayed. We were waiting for the NGS, the, the next generation science standards, to be developed because we knew that the Massachusetts science standards wouldn't get developed until the NGSS came out. And at the same time, so, so we were reluctant to, to make whole big purchases for grade levels of science materials, not knowing what those standards, how they were changing. And at the same time, we didn't want to get old books. You know, we go from the good to the bad and the ugly. You know, th this is pre-2000. Pre <laughs> and, and, and that's what, that's what we're using, in a sense, right now. So we wanted to go to digital resources. It's, it's definitely the way to go. But then we also had to, to uh, be cognizant of when the digital access was going to be there. And you know, it, it came up through the, middle, the uh, elementary school and is now finally there. So we're ready to roll. Uh, we have some money in the in the budget for next year to explore those digital resources and start recommending. So we're, we're moving in that direction. This is our current curriculum and this is already partly revised to the new standards. We've moved a few things around already. Astronomy used to be in the eighth grade, now it's in the sixth grade. And we're just kind of finding what we need to move into to align ourselves with the new standards. So we have old texts, but creative teachers who have been developing their own materials along the way, and we have that budget to, to help that process along. Uh, they, they keep it lab-oriented, and we've had a great writing program, uh, a, a CER program, Claims Evidence Reasoning, and that's through sixth through eighth. The students are asked to really defend what they do in their lab experiments and collecting data, explain it, and argue, and, and produce arguments that will defend it. So uh, at the middle school, we also have some state and nationally acclaimed technology teachers uh, from the Mass Tech and NSTA and the International Technology Educators um, Association. We've had some awards acclaiming our program and our teachers as, as top notch. And, and Technology is, is in the new standards, it is an equal part to all the sciences. Mm -hmm. And so we're, we're proud to, to sponsor that and to, and to have a robust program there. And it has engaging and pertinent after school activities. This year we had to double the amount of staff that 
would manage the robotics people because there were so many kids that wanted to be part, part of it. We have had a growing science fair effort at the middle school. Moving quickly on to the high school, we have solid core courses. And we try to maintain a heavy lab emphasis, although size and scheduling has, has started to become a limitation. Um, and we, at the same time, are, are increasing our use of digital access. And, and we thank the AEF, uh, some AEF members who were instrumental in, in bringing up us new digital access devices, walked through our school today, and I think they found they enjoyed what they saw. We thank the Capitol Committee for all their contributions to that, and, and you, the Ar Arlington Public Schools, and, and the, the people who make those decisions. Those, we're, we're moving along, we're on a moving train now, and uh, we're, gonna, we're gonna try to keep it going that way. Uh, so we have you know, our core courses, introductory physics, biology, chemistry, and physics, and our electives. We're proud of these capstone courses, astronomy, archaeology, oceanography, anatomy and physiology, engineering, environmental science. There's a lot there to interest kids. And they, and they, um, and they show that to us. I'll show you the statistics in a, in a minute. Uh, our AP is growing. Um, so you can see the years here. And next year, we're anticipating eight sections. And our enrollment is going from 136 to 183. Part of that is uh, our Enviro AP, which was recently enough added. And we are still struggling with that a little bit, which I think you'll see in the next slide. We, you know, we needed to, we brought in a, new, a, a teacher had never taught that before, it was a new curriculum, so we had some alignment to do. So our, our, our performance in the AP is really quite strong. In the bio and chem and physics, these are scores three, four, and five. In the AP, as I said, we, we needed some alignment and calibration. I think we're there. Uh, I think this last year we were there, but we will see in July when the new scores come out. Um, so this is, this is sort of like the issue that Matt Coleman brought up. We, we have a science requirement of three courses, but I just took a poll through, through uh, our data specialists of the average number of science courses taken by senior over their four years here, and it's 4.28. So not only did most students surpass the requirement of three and take four, but about 28% took a fifth course. Mm -hmm. So that brings up the same question that you asked, Bill. You know, are we pushing the kids too much? Well, uh, again, I think we, we counsel the kids carefully to, to, to not look at this as an, as an isolated choice. You know, in fact, just today I had a student say, can I, you know, as a sophomore, can I take AP uh, environmental and chemistry? And I said, I don't think so. <laughs> I think an a AP environmental is a capstone course. So first of all, you'd be going into it without <coughs> biology and chemistry, and, and you know, you wouldn't get as much out of it. So we do counsel our kids when to and when not to take these courses, and of course that social emotional piece is very strong there. Because if, the, if students want to take three honors and three APs, of course they're gonna be stressed out, and only some kids can do that. So uh, our MCAS is strong and growing. These are just two snippets. Uh, all students on the, on the top left you know, in going from 14 to 15, uh, the, the colors don't show it here, but uh, on the left is, is um, advanced, second left is proficient, third left is needs improvement, and, and the right side is failure. And so we've increased, going from 14 to 15, our, our proficiency, our, our advanced, I mean, quite significantly, and we've decreased our needs improvement a bit. We still have a lot of work to do. We're interested in those kids that are in that gap. And even though we make some, you know, you can see that our proficient group went up, you know, we, we, still, have, we still have more people in those um, later bars there than we want. And we're, we're looking at strategies to solve that. So we have many adjunct activities at the high school. 
robotics, Olympiad, EnviroGuard, and Makerspace internships and seminars. We have a lot of, lot of speakers come in, you know, all the way from astronauts to many, many different scientists and science writers. And the future directions. So we, we really see increasing our digital access. We're moving into a BYOD. You know, will there be, uh, there'll be uh, hurdles and, and hiccups along the way, and we'll figure out what those are, and we'll work our way through them. And, and as that occurs, we're looking at more digital resources and increased lab space. We really need that. Now, the new building project should solve that over time. Uh, and, and it's hard to just make space appear. And, and we realize that. So that's why we're, we're trying to juggle things. Uh, and we try to keep those lab populations within safe limits. This is a, a graph out of a report from the, the state of Texas, which covered data from about 1,000 schools of class size at the bottom and the rate of accidents on the upper left. Mm -hmm. And as you get past 20 to 24 in labs, you can see that that rate starts to go up exponentially. We want to try to watch that. Mm -hmm. um, so that's why we try to be, be careful about our lab populations, our sizes. Uh, and of course, you know, we're, we're here for, for the globe and we want our kids to go out of Arlington High prepared and understanding the issues and having some tools to feel empowered about dealing with those, those issues rather than feeling doom and gloom. So. You saw, again, that in the uh, assumption of time for the standards, we probably need to have more time somewhere. We're trying to figure out how to do that. And that's all. So questions? Yes. Uh, Mr. Thielman. So I just want to ask three questions. First of all, uh, years ago, I recall a struggle to find science teachers. There was, there was, a, there was turnover in the science uh, positions and could you just kind of give us an update on on how we're doing on turnover yeah and how we're doing on retaining teachers and hmm. and vacancies? well it's a, it's a struggle when we have a um, when we have an opening because somebody leaves in physics or chemistry mm -hmm. and sometimes physics and chemistry uh, we have some choices to make that involve do we need a physics teacher and a chemistry teacher? And do we need to hire two? Or do we need to hire who will fit that one bill? And maybe that person's a little more expensive. And we have to do that. Uh, th these are critical areas. And um, they're not as easy to come by. I think I, uh, you know, statistically in the last round of, of, a, of a ex advanced science course hiring, I probably had five or six uh, appropriate candidates you know, and um, that's not th that that's not a lot no. yeah you know considering after you interview them there oh, some please. drive drop by the okay. way so so how are we doing that we, we we try to attract them we we listen to their needs they're here for the most part I could say that the science teachers are here because they are passionate about teaching science they're not here because uh, the because they have their uh, a, an extra month during the summer they're not here because they have uh because they're making more money than they would make in industry they're <laughs> they're not here for a variety of reasons they're here because they love to teach kids science and and so we have to listen to their needs so that they can do that well and they when they succeed our kids will succeed mm -hmm. so we're, we're i think we're, our, our turnover is it's been and been pretty slow lately Good. In fact, we've been expanding, trying to take care of some of that um, lab size issue, you know. And so we, we've we've been growing, and the people that are here, for the most part, are staying. Good. So. And but I, I I should have prefaced my my questions by saying this is a great presentation. So it's a what? <laughs> this was a great presentation. Oh, thank you. And I should have begun that way. The next uh, question I had is, could you talk a little bit about uh, you know, the, the MCAS scores for the high need students are not where we want them to be, I guess. I'm sorry. The I, MCAS. The sometimes the yep. distraction. Yeah, I'll talk louder. The MCAS scores for the high needs students are not as loud, uh, not as loud, not as, <laughs> not as high 
as we, as we would like them to be. That's right. So I just would like someone, maybe either you or Dr. Bodie or Dr. Chesson, to talk about what's the strategy to uh, help what, those high need students. What we're doing, part of what we're doing is is in our um, using the Edwin Analytics, the uh, analysis branch of the all the data that the state collects. We can disaggregate that data, mm -hmm. and so we disaggregate it by high needs and, and all students. And, we, and so we look at the data, and what we do is we analyze strands and questions. So we can, we can look at themes and saying, let's see, our high needs students are having trouble with these kinds of questions. Let's see what we can do to bolster that part of our teaching curriculum, because we know we have the data. We do our DDMs and our, and our common assessments, and we look at that data, and we disaggregate it. So we're trying to get some insights into what areas they need more support in. That, that's one thing. We're also in our AP courses. Uh, AP pr uh, produces a report every year called uh, AP, I, I forget the term, AP Access. And, and they help us to analyze kids that have potential to, to go further in science, uh, of all, all kids. You know, and so we, we specifically, we've had a grant that just ended this last year to try to increase high needs kids' participation in AP courses. And we tried to bring those in by analyzing that, that data from the college board. Uh, sensitivity training and awareness, we're doing that. We're working with, with the, you know, the rest of the administration to, to try to say what what do these kids need and why why are, are there more difficulties and how do we bridge those gaps so we're trying to look at that and make people aware of it you know wh what are the issues make teachers aware of them uh, so that they can offer more supports uh, i think those are probably the general things some of the challenges also that students have is the reading of the material on the tests. Yeah. And so we're really working as a curriculum team to identify those transferable skills so that the methods that, you know, claims, evidence, um, that, that process, we're looking at, well, what do we call that in other subject areas? Um, how do we help kids with close reading? How do we help them with informational reading? And use the same techniques across all subject areas mm -hmm. to, in order to, to bolster those kids. Yeah, we're really emphasizing that. In fact, a, a comment from a, a, a teacher who was an, is an AP teacher here, and uh, the, the AP tests were just a week or so ago, and, and so I said, so how do the kids do, how do you think, how do they comment that they did? And, and the kids' comments are, oh, there's so much writing on that test. <laughs> you know, it's not A, B, C, D. Right. Yeah. The, and the writing isn't, you know, describe this experiment. It's student A says this and student B says this, who's right and why? You know, and uh, so it's, it's claims, evidence, reasoning, and we're preparing the kids for that. Mm -hmm. and, and that's the way the new... MCAS 2 will probably come out, and that's, that's one of the ways they're gonna get at inquiry, is, is to have kids explain what they have experienced through inquiry by dialogue, so. I'm good. Uh, Dr. Allison Abbey. Um, I wanted to follow up on Mr. Thielman's question about the MCAS. Can you pull up the graph? I, I can, absolutely. So, I agree that we certainly have room to improve, but I just wanted to point out that there was a significant improvement yes, from yes, 2014 the, to 2015. I tried to yeah, I mention that, that I mean, the, uh, the uh, proficient went up significantly enough, yeah. and the, uh, the advance didn't go down, mm -hmm. yeah. and, and we, we pulled from that needs improvement. Yeah, that, that's... Yeah, that we, I, we're I making progress, but we've got work impressive. to do. You know, I'd like that bottom right graph to be the top left graph at some yes. point. Yes. No, I, I I agree, but I just thought <laughs> that you even even you that know out. that for one year is is really impressive. Um, and then if you can go back to your class size graph, the the second to last slide. Uh, the what? Which graph? Second to last slide. Oh. Yeah, I'm wondering. What size, what's the average class size in Arlington for science classes, looking at? Well, that's, um, to answer that, I'd have to have a magic wand mm -hmm. <laughs> because uh, it, in some sense, it's a strategy game. And so when we start the, the scheduling process, we know that students will change a bit. Mm -hmm. 
some students, and rightfully so, want to challenge themselves, part of what you were talking about, Bill, sometimes over-challenge themselves and decide, you know, I'll be better off if I'm in a different section, and those numbers change throughout the year. And so we start out with a really strong imbalance in our higher level courses, very, very large class sizes, 25, 26, 27, 28 mm -hmm. in a lab. And then we expect that over the course of the year as kids make different choices, that those will level out to the, to the 24 mm -hmm. range. And that the other classes which start out very small and make, mm -hmm. you, you know, if you looked at it in the beginning, you might say, how come we're offering classes that small? But it's because they're gonna fill up. Okay. okay. And so, so we, we adjust that. And, and ideally, I would love to have our, class, our lab classes at 20 or so, 22. Mm -hmm. You know, sometimes we don't make it because when we have nine sections of an honors level class, uh, the scheduling doesn't always go so that they're averaged out. Mm -hmm. Sometimes one class will be 28 and then another one will be 17. Okay. So we do our best to try to keep them in by, to the mid-20s, but it doesn't always work. Okay, thank so. you. And then the last question is kind of for either you or the administration, which is I was glad that you brought up about sort of dual counting time when you can do both ELA and science at the same time. When what? When, when you can do both ELA and science at the same time. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm just wondering, how do we count that time? I mean, do we actually double count it when we're trying to figure well, out how much time they're we're spending? We're working through that a bit. Okay. We're, we're not there yet. And so uh, those are all good questions. You know, I, in, in a sense, they're, they're integrated time. Yeah. You know, they're, they're, uh, they're both. Yeah, no, Larry, it, it Larry's makes talking sense. about it's the elementary level. Just oh, I'm so sorry, yeah. talking yeah. about the elementary. Yeah, yeah. just so we're yes. clear, we're talking about more. Yes, right. that was only the elementary. Right. When we do that, we do that at the elementary level, and right. they'll be planning this summer in both social studies mm -hmm. and science mm -hmm. as they're doing their professional development. This informational topic could be, I was uh, at a professional development experience this week on Tuesday, grade five does something called clean water. If that match, that was, that's their reading unit. That's mm -hmm. not their science unit. Mm -hmm. However, it could tie into their science unit or we might say, well, that's not fifth grade science, that might be fourth grade science. And so then we move it down to fourth grade. So there's gonna be a lot of work done on that integration this mm -hmm. summer. Mm -hmm. But when we count things, do we actually count, it counts the minutes for both science and for ELA, or I mean, I'm not trying we to. Haven't, we haven't gotten that far yet. We don't. Okay. We haven't gotten that far, right? It we, makes we sense. We don't know. It's it's, it's a curious. it's a new issue, and and I think other people around the state are experiencing the same thing because there's there's just so much to do. There's so much on the plates mm -hmm. of these teachers that we have to figure out smarter ways to let them do really good things, mm -hmm. and not be frustrated about it, and not uh, give up on some of it. Mr. Hainer. Thank you for this and all the work that you do. Oh, thank The you. elementary teacher in me goes, your, your sixth slide, the grade three physical science, uh, the, the piece that you wrote. I can remember having students, science lends itself to a lot of projects, hands on, and assessing some of my students that I figured I had a, a future Enrique Fermi or uh, great science is coming, but when they had to take a written test, and to show these skills made by the state and stuff like this, and it becomes very abstract for them and very, very difficult. Right. I'm, I'm hoping through you and other teachers, when they come up with the tests on these standards, there's some way of getting a kinesthetic or hands-on way for these children to evaluate. Because in the classroom at the elementary level and even at the high school level in chemistry and stuff, they learn these things. Yes, they're writing down responses and stuff, but asking the detailed questions to show evidence and stuff, often the child can do it by showing you. Right. And having the, the tools that they were using initially. Yes, they transferred it to their notebook and writing and stuff, but it's, it's more real in the real world. So I guess what I'm asking you. I, I appreciate that. And, and I, I assure you, too, that we are doing that in our own classes. Right. The, the struggle comes with the standardized state testing. Exactly. In our own classes, <clears throat> it would be very easy for an elementary teacher to come up and say, hey, you know, tell me about these five plants here. How come one's wilted? And, uh, and in a sense, that's a, both a performance assessment and, and maybe a summative as assessment as well. And so we're, when we're doing that in our classes. 
my, again, my concern is, and, and hopefully you as a director will have some influence on the state to let them know. That. Oh, well, we're trying. Thank you. Sure. <laughs> Great. Thank you very much. Awesome. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Great. You, if you would like, you're, oh, you know, you these are back. very rich resources. Uh, you know, if you want to look at them, take them home. Just bring them back, and you know, we're not going to use them anymore this year. So you could just, you know, leave these them somewhere so in the. These are so new. Uh, I'm afraid to look at. I'm afraid. <laughs> <to take laughs> them. Yeah, yeah. They're it, so could, it could be your bedside <laughs> reading for the next week. You know. Uh, no. Okay. That's Thank you. Happened. Thank you very much. Book here, and I learned something. That's yeah, great, great. Yeah. Right. Great, <laughs> well, thank you very much. Kids yeah. too. Thank you again. Thanks, Larry. Okay, we are now 10 minutes behind, but not bad, not bad. Um, Math too. Okay, so the next item on the agenda are the Gibbs decisions. And what I want to do for both of these votes is before we propose a motion and discuss a motion, I want to get sense of the committee about whether we are ready to take these votes or not. So I've quickly get that sense. Thumbs up, thumbs down. <laughs> this was about the Gibbs class. configuration question. I okay, it sounds like, vote. okay, this is, that's a good way to do it. Um, <laughs> so we are ready to take this thing. So let's, um, we need a motion on the table. Uh, Mr. Thielman. <laughs> Move that the Arlington School Committee endorses Dr. Bodie's recommendation to configure the Gibbs facility as a sixth grade school. Second. Okay, uh, motion by Mr. Thielman, seconded by Mr. Schlickman, and- Just a question. Yes. Is endorse a, the word or to go forward with a sixth, Dr. Bodie's recommendation? Um, I, I, thought we, I, I thought we had already endorsed a, this a month or so ago. Yeah. Uh, no, this is the specifically about the, the configuration. Right. No, what I'm saying. We didn't. It, we didn't say anything about the, the we, configuration we yet. The Gibbs, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, we haven't said anything yet. But I, yeah. So uh, uh, I just recommend change the word endorse to uh, uh, go forward with the superintendent's recommendation for six. So go forward, friendly move, amendment. Move forward with yes. Move to forward. move friendly amendment to move forward rather than endorse. That's right. Yeah. That's okay. Right. So move forward. Okay. Discussion of the motion. <laughs> Mr. Cardin. Uh, thanks. Um, so uh, I just want to emphasize that we're choosing between two good options. Um, and my vote on this motion should not be interpreted as any concern with the sixth grade option being, you know, potentially being a very good thing and a very successful thing for our students. Uh, while I greatly respect the preferences of the school administration and the Audison teachers about the sixth grade option, I also respect the preferences of the parents who responded to the survey, who attended the forum in January, and who I spoke to while I was running for this seat, who do prefer the two, school middle, two middle schools option. I'm not voting against this motion because I think the two, school middle, two middle schools option is necessarily better than the sixth grade only option. I don't think we can make that determination with any uh, certainty. But between two good options, I'm choosing to join with many parents who prefer the two middle school option. Okay. Mr. Sleepman. Um, I think the preponderance of the uh, evidence uh, overwhelmingly supports uh, the Gibbs sixth grade option. Um, one, one reason certainly is equity, and it, it wouldn't be intentional. We, t we talked about this last night. Uh, did we go look at towns with two middle schools? And uh, my esteemed colleague who works in Lexington described the uh, accidental inequity in two schools that are identically sized. Uh, we would be setting up a small middle school and a large middle school. And that would breed inequity in that there are programs that we would not be able to offer in the smaller school. And there are uh, climate issues that we would have in the smaller, you know, the climate would be different in a smaller school than in a larger school. And I, I don't want one end of the town to have one kind of school and the other end of the town to have a, a completely different kind of school. As we set up our elementary programs, we were very careful to bring equity to all of our seven schools so that there isn't a substantive difference in, in the education offered. And I don't think that we could provide that equity uh, by having two, six, seven, eight schools. Number two, uh, certainly the cost factor. 
Um, the evidence shows that it would cost more to run a uh, two, six, seven, eight schools. Um, and that in discussions with the Finance Committee, who said, uh, we really can't afford to add to the costs, we came back and said, if, the, if we feel strongly enough that we prefer this, that we would make reductions in other programs in order to support a 678 over there. I see nothing that's educationally sound to support redirecting resources from other programs to turn the Gibbs into a 678. Um, one of the issues was transportation and walk to. Now, I live a half a mile from the Bishop's School, and my neighbor is certainly walkable, and I've walked to the Bishop's School often because it's a very pleasant little walk over there. But every day when I'm leaving for work, my neighbor would be driving her child to the bishop. So that having a walk to, in, in theory, having a walkable school doesn't mean people are going to walk. And by virtue of the congestion that we have around elementary schools that are all walkable, I don't think that uh, we're going to achieve some sort of nirvana by having a more walkable configuration east to west. Now there are going to be traffic issues. The traffic issues will indeed be less at the Odyssey because we will be reducing the number of students going there. Um, there will be more traffic in the Gibbs neighborhood, of course, because we're going from a, a tenancy situation to a full-blown school with 500 kids. And uh, there, we will have two years to get a traffic plan out. We have successful traffic plans. We've worked with the, tra the TAC uh, to solve our traffic issues. And if you live on the east side of town, you will have one year of close school and two year of schlepping across town. And if you live in the Heights, you'll have one year of schlepping across town and two years of being close. And it's not that big a town. It's five square miles. And I know that traffic in the center can be a little unnerving at times, but um, you know, we do live in an urban environment. Um, the evidence is so strong for doing the sixth grade school, and the um, and no matter which configuration we go to, we will have challenges that we will need to meet. Uh, but uh, we will be able to move forward. We will be able to meet the special needs uh, issues. We will be able to meet the traffic needs. Uh, and we just have to do this. We need to go forward with the Gibbs 6. Do you hear other thoughts? Mm -hmm. Dr. Allison Ampey. Um, I didn't think of preparing a speech. Mm -hmm. um, I'll be voting for the Gibbs 6, um, but in doing so, I'm not trying to, I, I know that we've heard from many parents who would also prefer a six through a second six through eight school there. Um, like Mr. Schlickman, I feel that the educational benefits, the cost benefits, um, and the equity, actually, I didn't put them in the right order. For me, it's the equity is first, education is second, and then financial is a necessary, but is def definitely a distant third. All of these are why I feel it's important to choose to go with the Gibbs 6 option. Um, but I very much want to hear over the coming year as we plan and, and begin to renovate um, how we're going to address mm -hmm. the concerns that are raised, especially the special education population and how we're going to make this mm -hmm. the best possible experience for them. Um, second, any other students who will have issues with the additional transition, which we're going to then be creating. Um, and then finally, the impact on the parents or on the people who, the local community in terms of traffic and, and the other issues. And I think that there's a lot of things that we can do towards all of these. Um, I did some research over the last few days, found a government website which lists schools that you can search by sizes. Mm -hmm. There's a, almost 120 in the U.S. that are sixth grade only. Mm -hmm. um, of those, um, over almost 70 of them are over 300 students or more. Mm -hmm. And so I think are fairly comparable to what we're setting up. 
And I think that we can start reaching out to some of these other schools and find out how did they achieve, and not necessarily the traffic we're going to have to deal with, you know, that, that's site specific, but the things like special education and dealing with transitions, other people have grasped with these problems. Let's find out how they've done it and if we can get any ideas. Um, so that's how I'm going to vote and why um, I hope that community members who have concerns about this choice will continue to reach out to us and tell us why so that we can address their concerns and, and solve the problems, especially before we open the school. Okay. Mr. Thurman. So I'll be voting for the sixth grade option. Uh, I think there are pluses and minuses to both the sixth grade option and the sixth through eight option. The, the one thing I'll say with the sixth grade option is that this is a this will be a new experience for the town of Arlington. We're creating a new school and a new model, and it's something this district hasn't done since we reconfigured the middle school 25 years ago, whenever that took place. So it's a new uh, moment for the town. It takes a it takes a, a you know maybe a different set of skills than we've used in the past to solve uh, problems and challenges. So I hope that <clears throat> we. Um, do what Kirsty suggested, look at a lot of different schools, I hope we think creatively, I hope we look at, uh, I know we're looking at Needham and everything that Needham's doing, and I hope we use uh, the talent of the people in the building, um, and that we uh, think very critically, and that there's a lot of good creative tension in the process between teachers, administrators, parents, staff, because that, that'll lead to the creation of something wonderful, which I think we want to do. But this is a new experience for the town of Arlington, and part of the reason why I'm voting for it, because I think it's good for us as, as a district to embark on something new, but it has to be understood that it's brand new, and it's something people haven't done before. Most of us haven't done before. So I'm voting yes, and um, I think it's an exciting moment with a lot of work ahead of us. Mm -hmm. Anyone else? I'm just going to say a couple things, um, which is that I think if we had unlimited money and unlimited space, we'd create eight equally sized elementary schools and two equally sized middle schools, and they'd feed into the high school. Um, that uh, my decision is partly because of the constraint of our buildings, but that I think with that constraint comes some opportunity uh, to really create a unique transitional space between the relative protected environment of elementary school and the more difficult environment of seventh and eighth a middle school experience. Um, and I look forward to the kinds of um, opportunity that this presents. Um, I also have to say that I've been in several rooms of parents who were initially opposed to this idea and who after discussion, especially with educators, um, sort of came around to supporting it. But the initial thought was, was no. Um, and then through discussion, sort of changed their mind. And that was very, very um, influential in my decision. I'll be voting yes for this. Yeah, wait, one more. Yes, Mr. Thurman. So I, I just as a side point, you know, one, th one thing to, th well, I don't want to get too far, to, too far ahead of things. But to, one thing to think about, actually, is to uh, be hiring a principal a year in advance of the opening of the school. So there's somebody um, <coughs> driving the process a year in advance. So I didn't mean to throw the that in the budget discussion right now. But that's really how you would, that's how you would start a new school. You'd have the academic leader on, yeah. on board a year in advance of opening. <clears throat> Mr. Hainer. Just to go along with what Mr. Thalman said, mm -hmm. it is a new school to some degree. It will be a new principal to some degree. But we have teachers already in place. So I would, and, and I'm sure you, you've thought of it. Uh, I've seen other schools do it. The teachers are actively involved mm -hmm. to, to start that new person off with a very positive thing. Uh, we, it is new, and it's pieces of, of what we've got. So it, it is very unique, as you said. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Great. OK, so uh, should we take a roll call vote? No. Roll, no? Just take a? Just take call a vote. OK, so all those in favor, please signify by saying yes or aye. Yes. 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 And yes for myself. All those opposed? Nope. Mr. Cardin. Um, and that is it. Okay, um, actually, I'd like to introduce a motion, a second motion, um, to direct the town GIS department and the Transportation Advisory Committee to study what I think is a very serious issue of traffic, especially because we're talking about eastbound traffic during rush hour, mm -hmm. and to come um, back to us and to the school department with some ideas. Mm -hmm. um, so discussion on the motion or comments, yes. 
Mr. Cardin. Yeah, well, I mean, I think, I think we also have to look at it as to what we can provide as far as busing. I mean, if we can provide, particularly for the sixth grade, you know, there, there, are, there are a lot more sixth graders. I, I think there's not a lot more, but there, the, the sixth graders from all, almost all of Dallin, Pierce, some of Stratton, some of Brackett are out of the two mile zone. Mm -hmm. So I think if we take a first look about how many kids are gonna be bused, where they're coming from, mm -hmm. then we can provide some additional data to that. Right, I think that's already mm -hmm. done. Mr. Hainer. Correct me if I'm wrong, don't we have to, doesn't the state require us to budget for any child, for the number of children that qualify? Uh, Whether we, beyond, beyond, beyond the two, the two miles. miles. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, Dr. Lee. Yeah. I've already started. <laughs> uh, in fact, done quite a bit of work on it. Because we've looking at our current third grade and where they are distributed in town and, and you're correct that, that we're going to have many more students that are beyond the two mile in this, in this situation. Um, it's hard to say yet because one of the things we're looking at too is how close students are to um, Mass Ave um, in terms of how many students would probably choose that over and being reimbursed over being on a bus because what our experience is presently and has been for a number of years is that more students choose reimbursement than they choose going on the school bus. Part of it is not wanting to get up so early, to be honest, yeah. <laughs> it's true. Yeah. Uh, because they get up, have to be at the bus stop early and um, they get to school earlier and then they have to participate, they usually participate in a and PM. So we are looking at this, when we have, we've been, uh, Adam Karofsky and I have been looking at maps, walking maps, and we'll be, our director of transportation has been looking at bus routes. But we have time to plan on the plan and I certainly want um, input and we'll, as we did before, we'll probably, once we get some, um, a place where we're ready to have some feedback, we wanna get feedback on, on the plan and we'll probably wanna do a survey at some point just to get a sense of how many parents would prefer to carpool or go on Mass Ave bus or go on the school bus and, and look, at, look at that. So, so just to clarify, um, the school department is responsible for anybody who lives over the two miles, mm -hmm. but if someone lives 1.9 miles, they're unlikely to walk, and what we want to make sure is that those kids don't get driven individually in cars. And so I'd like, that's why I'm putting forward the motion to sort of direct mm -hmm. the town to GIS department and the Transportation Advisory Committee to sort of look at those kinds of issues. Mm -hmm. Yep, yeah. Dr. Alice Amphi. First, I'm not sure we had a second on the motion. And oh, we did, second. sorry. Second. Well, I will. For discussion. Okay, thanks. <laughs> I, I will make the motion for the purposes of discussion. your requesting a motion out there, Madam Chair. Okay, yeah. so. The Chair requested oh, oh, a motion. I, I, don't, I can't put a motion out. You can. Well, you can. Yeah. You asked for it, though. All right. <laughs> we're we're gotta, splitting hands. <laughs> All right, Karen, does that, is that clear yeah. to you? Well, yeah, that's what I was. Yeah, okay. So, yeah. are you going to say Paul? Uh, sure, fine. Yeah. Uh, Paul and Dr. Alexander. Okay, Hainer second. Yes. But my second okay. point is, I'm not sure we can direct the town the to do request. anything. We well, can ask. We can ask. Yes, right. Oh, I'm sorry. Yes, you're right. Yes. We can ask. <laughs> yes. Ask. Yeah. We can yeah. ask. Yes. Ask. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks. That's what we will do. Yeah. Yes. Um, anyway. I mean, uh, th 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 frankly, this was actually something that um, Mr. Chaplain yep. said we should maybe ask, ask him, <laughs> officially happen. ask him. That's no. fine. Yes, Mr. Chaplain. I, I think yes. the other thing we should ask uh, at this point is for the uh, Transportation Advisory Committee to look at things like one-way patterns and, and, mm -hmm. tra and things we can do to enhance mm -hmm. traffic flow and safety around the school. Runs. I mean, ideally, you've got yeah, streets that are one they, way. Those are one way. Yeah, they're, they're all one way, right? They're, they're both one way, but yeah. they're both one way so that if you're bringing a school bus down the street, the bus right. is on the wrong, the door is on the wrong side, and the kid would have to, the kids would have to cross in front of the bus. Right. That's right. Right. So that to flip mm -hmm. one of those would possibly enhance safety okay. on, uh, right. on uh, for, for kids traveling on the bus. Mm -hmm. Every other one going all the way or at least you need a, or at least you need a driveway yeah. around yeah. the school or yeah. something yeah. Yeah. something they should look into it yeah work. okay yeah. so i mean it's, there's a lot of issues to involve yeah. uh ready to vote 
All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Okay. Um, okay, so our next item, um, I also want to get a sense from the committee whether we are ready to vote to take the Gibbs out of surplus or not. Yes. Yes. Aye. Okay. Um, so actually, um, so Mr. Schlichtman? I'd like to make a motion. Well, the, before the motion, I actually want to get a sense yeah. from the committee about whether we're ready to do this. this Absolutely, yeah. yeah. Well, Kirsten, I, I thought we already did. No. I mean, um, to take the Gibbs out of surplus? The, the official. We, we have not yet voted. Time. We haven't done the official vote yet, and I'd like to make the motion, which awesome. we can then discuss. So, Great. We got a majority already. What? We're ready? Okay. Okay. Great. Um, I move that the Arlington School Committee declares that we require the use of the Gibbs School for educational purposes uh, no later than July 1, 2017, and that the Arlington School Committee requests that the Town of Arlington notify all tenants at the Gibbs School that their leases will not be renewed after their termination on June 30th, 2017. Okay. Second. Second. Mr. Hainer, second. Okay, discussion on the motion. Did, yes, Dr. Asmanthi. So I had asked in previous meetings whether there was any necessary legal language that we needed to mm -hmm. use. Mm -hmm. Is this it? Or are yeah, we mean, just we, guessing? We were told that we, we, were told that we don't need anything specific. State this yeah. basically. Okay. That, yeah. uh, if, 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 if council receives this and uh, quest, uh, needs something in addition, I'm sure we could revote it. But based on the conversations we had earlier in, this, in the process, uh, that's all we need to do, mm -hmm. uh, which directs the yeah, things yeah, that's down as far as I understand the rest that's of the way. We don't need anything so very complicated. It, yeah. it may be even more detailed than we need to, but I, I just wanted to cover the basis. Okay. Uh, it, it's important that we do this. The tenants already are now finding alternate places to be. Uh, so it, it, on one level, it's going to happen naturally, but I think that uh, the sooner we say that we're, we're moving forward, we're going to do this, uh, we need this facility, uh, you know, why, why delay? Well, let's, let's just move this forward. Okay. Mr. Hainer. If we have a building, we're no longer using it, we declare it surplus, then the town has control over it. Up till then, they don't. Right. This, we did that with Gibbs X amount of years ago. Right now, we're asking, asking with this vote for the town to take it back, uh, give it back to us for our use. So that's what we're doing in this motion, is making a request to the town once the town does that, we will then have uh, legal uh, ownership or, or control of the building. So we're, we're basically requesting it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, do I, I just want to say I um, was not in favor of taking this vote at this time uh, just because I thought it, it made sense to hear from the voters. Um, I mean, in terms of just the timing seemed seemed odd to me, but um, but it seems to be the consensus of the committee, so that is what I would defer to. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, okay. I any more, any more comments? Yes. You have the this language, right? You have Paul's language. You Let me get it. it. I, I yeah. just emailed it oh, to you. Okay. okay. <laughs> <laughs> and we don't need. Uh, so Doug Hyam said, "This is not." Okay. Yeah. 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 Okay. Mm -hmm. All those in favor? Aye. 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 All opposed? And I'm going to abstain. Yes. Okay. Can, yes. Can, Dr. Can, um, can I ask through the chair, Dr. Chesson, yes. was, was it you who was telling me about Concord changing to a six, seven, eight model? I, I was. Oh, you were. Could you just, I didn't want to bring this up because I didn't want to suggest we were making our decision because of it, but I thought it was an interesting sidelight on our decision making, just what's going on in Concord. Mm -hmm. Well, they have two middle schools, one's a little bit bigger than the other, and they have decided, my understanding is they're going to have to defer a year because of the size of the class that would be entering, but they're going to go to a 6 and a 7 and 8, and it's not about enrollment. They just think that would be a better model um, for Concord. Typical yeah. Concord, trying to keep up with Arlington. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> We're with so everything. ahead of them. With everything except the budget. Yeah. Just trying to keep up with us. Uh, it may change. They're looking for a new superintendent. I, I don't know oh, yeah. where no, that just, will stand, but that's currently. I thought currently. it was interesting that it yeah, came up at this point. Yeah. 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 So. Hmm. Lots of opportunity to talk to each other. That idea. We do. Yeah, great. We can talk to each other. Assistant principals in every building. Okay. Um, 
Now we're early, great. Mm -hmm. uh, so the next item on the agenda is to um, vote to renew uh, the Human Rights Commission Committee members, and we are fortunate that the current members have all elected to um, continue their appointment. So if it, if it is, if we are in agreement, we can go forward with that. If you remember last time we voted, I wasn't here, but um, for uh, Christine, so who do we vote for? For Sharon Ghost Grossman to continue. And I, at the time, I actually didn't realize how many other people's appointments were up at the very same time. So these are the remainder of the people. Uh, Mr. Slickman. I, I move reappointment. Great. Second? Second. Second by Ms. Starks. Mr. Slickman. Uh, discussion. Do you want to say their names? They're awesome. Yeah, let me say, I'll say their names. <laughs> yeah, I, Great, okay. I, I, I was just unaware that we get to uh, select we appoint all the members of this committee? No, we or do we not. Get just these um, from what I understand, uh, the Board of Selectmen appoints some people and the mm -hmm. uh, town manager. And, uh, not town manager. And all um, our appointees are, uh, are, are around. John Leone, okay. town uh, moderator. moderator. Yeah. I guess, yeah. I guess what, uh, then my next s surprise is that our appointees are all at the exact same time. They usually stagger. But that's fine. Thank you. They actually are staggered by a couple of months, but oh. it's all around... And I think Fine. that was probably the reappointment time. You know, one was February and one, which is delayed, and one was April. Um, but they're all around the same time. Okay, so let me read them um, out. Uh, there's Christine Carney, um, Gonda Di Figia, uh, Nick Man Minton, and Marlissa Brigitte. Bridget. Bridget. Is it Bridget? Yeah. Okay, great. Thanks, Bridget. Uh, so I think we are lucky to have um, dedicated volunteers. Like many things in Arlington, these are volunteers who are giving up their time to work on this um, important issue. And I think I think we're we're, we're lucky to have um, such dedicated volunteers. So all those in favor of reappointing uh, those four members, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed. Okay, it's a unanimous vote. Okay, so then there's the calendar update. Uh, Mr. Slippen? Uh, first, I'd like to move the calendar up. Okay. Um, and then we want to move approval. Uh, move approval. Move approval. Okay, so moved approval by second. Mr. Second. Mr. Slippen, seconded by Mr. Hayner. Um, I think we should have. Uh, this is for first. This is first. This is first reading. First, uh, oh, so uh, that's not. A, read, and, and I'd like to uh, move an amendment. Okay. So we don't move first read, is that right? Is that, okay, so we're not moving it. Okay. Yet. okay so. uh, I'd, I'd like to offer an amendment to the calendar. Okay, so actually, do we want to, I want to actually have Dr. Bodhi just give a couple words. Did you, is there something sure. that you want to say I, I think before and then we'll get to yeah. that? Okay. Yeah. Uh, first of all, let me just review some of the key things. I don't think it, it hurts to reiterate this, is that there's a couple of uh, big changes next year, and, and the first of that is our kindergarten. Uh, we are going to begin the first day for kindergarten just as we do for all of the students, except it's only going to be for an open house. And then half the kindergarten class will come one day and the other half on Wednesday, the other half on Thursday, and then the full group on uh, Friday. And the reason for this change is that we've decided to do the screening in June. Before when we had a delayed opening to the next week, uh, that was because we used that week to do screening, but um, the concerted opinion of teachers and administrators is that they would it would be much better in terms of classes to be able to have that information earlier. Our preschool, however, does start the following Monday on the 12th. So this calendar is very similar to previous years, but I will say that both the middle school and the high school will have an extra early release day. Mm -hmm. And the high school in particular needs an, er, an extra day in there because of all of the work facing it. Mm -hmm. And we'll talk more about that um, when we get to the MSBA decision yesterday. But there's a significant <coughs> amount of work that they're doing both in that area and some work that they've been committing to over the last um, year and a half on uh, diversity issues in the school. So, however, Dr. Chesson has looked at the uh, minutes and hours and we're fine. Mm -hmm. So that's not gonna be an issue. The other thing I would say about the high school is that I have a schedule here that's very similar to last year, uh, 
But Dr. Janger has indicated that we, we might need to tweak the dates for the conferences. They may actually move them up and be in concert with the middle school. But um, I will have that for you during the course of the week um, and let you know that. The middle school has decided to move conferences earlier in the year. Before, they used to have the conferences in December, but now they're going to be in November. And, and I think the, the, the reason for that is that they would like to talk with parents uh, before the end of the term, rather than after the this term. This may be influenced. Huh? <laughs> may be influenced. Yeah, but early, they, they think that earlier in the year makes more sense um, in, in, the, in this. And because we're finding that every block is taken for a middle school teacher, they're just completely scheduled, that we're adding a little bit more time in one of the afternoons. So there's going to be two afternoons and two evenings for the middle school. And those are in early November, as you, you can see there. And, and, and uh, I have to give um, Ms. Fitzgerald a lot of credit. <laughs> we worked on the codes on this, and finally we decided Probably the easiest thing, rather than coding this whole calendar up, which would make everybody a little crazy, is to actually list out the days of the early releases um, by level, and mm. so it's just really right. clear yeah. what's, what's going to happen. Yeah. And the other thing we try to do is make it consistent. If we're going to have a conference early release, it's 11.15. If we're going to have just a regular professional development day, it's 1 o'clock. The difference being that 11.15 no is going to have no lunch, and one o'clock, we'll have lunch. Um, so, in terms of changes, those were the major the major changes. We also decided again this year uh, not to go into late April, May, and June for any er, for any professional development. Once we hit those months, we're into testing, and we want to give as much flexibility as possible. Next year's window for MCAS 2.0 will actually begin in earlier April. I think it's April 6th, mm -hmm. isn't it? And it will go through May. So, and it makes sense in terms of pedagogy, educational goals, to have more of our professional development earlier in the year. The one that we have scheduled, and I'm not sure which one we'll do it, whether we'll do it in March or April, we need to have some early release time all levels to do any kind of training that might be necessary for the new 2.0. So that's, that's part of it. Another reason is that we wanted to make sure we had that time. So those are the main highlights of, of uh, the calendar. Otherwise, it's very similar to what uh, we've had in previous years. <coughs> now, I know you have some discussions you need to make about the meeting school. time for school committees. So actually, can I just ask one question, clarification? Yeah. You said that the um, high school is going to move to the similar time as the middle school. Well, I we don't know that. Oh, right now, they're but scheduled. I assume it's not the same day if we're looking. It's, it's similar timing. Is that, is that the thinking? M maybe the same days. Right now, have... right now, what they did last, this last year, and it seemed to work really well in October, they had um, an 11-15 dismissal for afternoon conferences. They stayed through and had evening conferences the same sure. night. Mm. Right. And I understood that that went pretty well, and then they had one more evening conference. And so that is how it's scheduled right now okay. for, the, for the high school. So the conferences for the high school are late October. The conferences for the middle school is early November. Mm -hmm. And elementary is staying the same in December because they wanted to have conferences after the first progress report. That's where we are. Questions, and I know you have an amendment. Mm -hmm. Any questions? I have some that I want. A question, the other day, Saturday when we had our retreat, we talked about potentially two retreats coming up. Is that something you'd want on the calendar? I'm asking the group. I'd so certainly like it on the We just announced them ahead of time once we've decided the time. That's fine. Yeah, we, I mean, we talked That's about fine. changing how we did our meetings. Yeah. 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 That's fine. Yeah. Okay, Mr. Slick. Okay. Um, I didn't catch this when I had the, my initial conversation with the chair about the calendar. Uh, she was very gracious to ask me what I thought and if there were any oh, conflicts right, right, on right. the calendar. And I didn't spot it then, but I did spot it when I saw the calendar in, in Novus, in that uh, the, this iteration doesn't have a second February meeting. 
uh, which, which results in the fact that we'd have 19 scheduled meetings and our policy dic dictates 20. There's another potential conflict in here in that March 23rd will be the League of Women Voters uh, debate and mm -hmm. we were looking to move our meeting off of that date this year so that uh, our candidate for re-election wouldn't need to make a decision between hanging out with us here and right, right. <laughs> uh, hanging out with the League of Women Voters. And I know that uh, uh, w when we run for re-election, it's always good to have friends and right. you know, and there's three of us. In, in the room. There's three of us. So, yeah. uh, so that uh, in order to rectify both, that we'd get the, the third meeting and we'd avoid the, uh, uh, the get our 20th meeting and then avoid the issue of conflicting with the League of Women Voters, that we delete the scheduled meetings for March 9th and March 23rd, and instead add the meetings for March 2nd, March 16, and March 30. Okay. Second. <coughs> Three in March. Right. But that, that, you know, think of the March 2nd as being yep. February 30th. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Um, I actually have a similar kind of, uh, we have, do we have to discuss and vote in this? I have a similar kind of suggested change. We do it all together? Yeah. Well, yeah, I mean. But, which is that I know I won't be available on December 22nd, and if you look at the calendar, it looks like we could easily shift that a week earlier and have a December 1st and a December 15th meeting. The first has a lot of conflicts for us with co a conference. Oh, it does? Yep. Okay. Um, Maybe we could do 8th and 15th? And the other possibility is I'm we've, not We've there. done that in the past. That's fine. Yeah. I'm just not there. Oh, That's eight, we've done two weeks in a row oh, did, in eight, December two weeks in a row. Past, so the 8th and the 15th. The 8th and 15th. Yeah. Mm -hmm. There are always these a, conflicts towards yeah. the end. Yeah, okay. I mean, again, I, I, it could also mean that I, I, yes. I don't So it's always to. good. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so. <coughs> I will tell you that the 15th is the elementary evening conference night. But. Elementary. But I don't know. Anybody have but that? Does, no. Elementary parents there. who have to go to conference. Other than when. Yeah. Yeah. There's <laughs> two afternoons as well. Right, right. So then you'll get priority picking that night. Well, as I mean. Yeah, if only. The other option is I'm just not <laughs> here, and that's that's huh? a perfectly plausible option if that just makes more sense. Uh, you know, that's a tough day because everybody's off on it's, holiday. It's right mode. almost before yeah. the holidays. Mm -hmm. That's that's why it's potentially a tough day. But uh, I'd say that that's that's a great idea to do the eighth and the fifteenth. Okay, we can. Well, elementary conferences. Is that going to be an issue? Okay. Yeah, Dr. Alessandri. Oh. Um, just looking at the calendar and remembering what was going on then, the problem is that that's kind of hitting peak budget season that's when right. we're yes. bringing. And right. so mm -hmm. I remember we were having to schedule people in and there was concern that things were going too early. So I'm just a little concerned if you're moving, you know, if you're shifting both meetings forward. That there's not that, enough time for people to prepare it may me Yeah, it may mess up budgeting, but, but well, I don't. We're only shifting but, one at this you know, point. We can, Kind of okay. set the okay. schedule then. now and then okay. adjust as we get we closer. We can also okay. keep it as is and, and adjust when we Mr. get there. Family yeah. can take over on that day. It's not a problem. <laughs> <laughs> that doesn't. No, I think it's better to try to get to schedule it so yeah. all seven of us have, have it on the okay. calendar right away so everybody knows. But I'm just saying. Okay, yeah. so let's. Okay, so we'll we'll put that on the calendar and if we need to, we'll, we'll shift it because of the budget. 15th, but if it gets, if, it, if mm, because of budget yeah. issues, then we need to shift yeah, them. I mean, if, yeah. So Nobody's let's take that. Nobody's going to want to come in and do, and do a budget presentation on the 22nd. Let's put it this way: our employees well, I mean, would not be. Better. But another option might be the 20th. 20, we, we could also yeah. right. I mean, we can we yeah. can yeah. always do things on a Thursday. on a Tuesday, Tuesday or something. Yeah. It was another possibility. Uh, yeah. yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah, can Dr. Just Alexander. to speak to Mr. Schlickman's comments, what I've brought up the there weren't 20 meetings scheduled before, and what I was told was, well, we'll have meetings over the summer, and that those will Ew. count into the 20. No. And I'm just saying okay. that, that this is what has been said before. So got it. I do not do that. Okay. Well, we're only uh, obliged to schedule 20, and if we, we don't have to have 20 if we don't need it, the right? Last meeting well, in June, we I, don't have. I, to. I, we don't <laughs> currently schedule a meeting necessarily in the summer, though it has happened. Yeah, yeah if, Mr. Rayner. If we stick with the our current calendar, we'll have 21 this year because last Saturday was a school committee meeting. Mm, right, and if we add extra things, okay. that, that's, so, true. <coughs> that's true. That's so true. We're so talking that, about potentially doing one or two more in the fall. Does that take some pressure off and of not needing so. to add another one in March? Well, it's just a busy time for us because yeah. we're finishing up the budget and doing a lot of work. So it's worth it keeping it. It's a busy it. time. Well, why don't we, okay, so why don't we keep it? Maybe we could also, again, adjust so, it. So you're saying so, we're going to keep the 2nd, the 16th, and the 30th in March? Yeah. Yes. Right. Okay. So there's. So let's do this all as one motion, I guess, right? So the, so the March 2nd. 
16th and 30th, 30th and then December uh, 5th and 19th. Mm -hmm. December 5th? You mean no. 8th? Oh, sorry. I'm, I'm looking at the wrong thing. I'm, uh, de yeah, December 1st and oh, 8th, no. and, 8th, and, 8th 15th. and 15th. 8th and 15th. Sorry, I was yep. looking at the wrong right. one. 8th and 15th. Uh, any more discussion on those? Okay. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Uh, and I want to sort of um, request uh, through the superintendent that when um, the middle school and high school and elementary school sort of schedule significant events that we ideally try to find a way for them not to schedule <coughs> these big no. significant events during school, school committee meetings, mm -hmm. if it's possible, mm -hmm. that we sort of get a sense from them. Um, well, guess what? <laughs> Conflict already. Yeah, I'll have to have a conversation with. I just got this information from the from the middle school. They wanted to have their curriculum night on the eighth of September. Let me go back to them now that I know which night you want. Yeah. Let me right. go back to them and see if we can get a different night. Yeah. Why don't we? I mean, we just need to sort of disseminate this early and, and widely. Just, this raises a question. You know, yeah. you know, parents have. Um, I think it's germane to the calendar, so just bear with me. Uh, parents have, some parents have said over the years that there's so many, there's sometimes just, there's like, you know, an AHS, there's, there's events going on in multiple schools on yeah. the same night. Yeah. Do, you, do you ever, do you monitor that, Kathy? I mean, do you guys, do you guys try to control, do people submit events to you in the central office? And no, they, they don't really. We have a central calendar now. I think it's going to be easier than it ever has been before, because yeah. if you look on the website, um, we now have a central calendar where all the major events and how we've defined it for everybody is that if you have an event that would potentially involve people beyond your school. Now, as soon as we define it this way, I'm not sure, I think we would still put a major event like curriculum night at the middle school on that central calendar on the website. Because then what we'll do is we'll see mm -hmm. that that hits a school committee night. Yeah. Yep. Mm -hmm. yep. We just didn't really have that tool before, but we do now have it. Or that that hits another night that some other school is having. Hits, you, know, <laughs> you know, Audison has the, the night curriculum the night, and, AHS, and yeah. but if the high a, school has their big concert. Yeah, well, yeah, I think we'll hit the, those, but we have to really be conscious of it. But the thing is, if Bishop had a, a chorus night, and that's Bishop community, yeah. and it's not going to affect anybody else. Right. It won't hit that central calendar. It'll hit the Bishop calendar. Oh. So it's something that we'll have to work at and think about how we're going to. It's challenging. Let's Unless the Bishop that. parent has a child at the high school. Then, oh, right. I mean, that's the, the same problem. So that's, that that's the so question. Obviously, a Bishop event is not going to conflict with a Thompson event. Right. Right. But if you, you a vertical articulation, we can once an elementary stakes something out of major any other elementary can pile on that <coughs> yeah. middle vertical or articulation that was what i was looking for well that, that <laughs> then that's uh, incumbent upon the middle and the high school to get their oar in the water that's that's right <laughs> yeah yeah i mean i think it'd be nice to collect this information even if we don't necessarily ask people to shift but just yeah. to sort of collect it so let me go back it to would the be good school. to have uh, get all these dates the, yeah, yeah at the beginning of the year and say okay look can, is there way we can move for a get, let's get your yeah. big ones on yeah. there and take a look at them yeah. it also yes. might be helpful for the community to know what's going on i mean there's all this great exciting thing going on so it'd be mm -hmm. you know it's pretty good pr too yeah we've talked about that whether how busy that central calendar would yeah. become Right. Because the good news is a lot is going on, right? And then that's right. the good news. But then when you try to organize it in one visual thing, right? That that became problematic, and and so we went the other direction. Maybe we shouldn't. Maybe we should just say have everything that's going on in each slot, right? At, at the very bottom of the calendar, there's a statement it, on mine. It's two thirds printed. It says <laughs> approved back in January. So. I, well, well it, yes, it I know I understand, so but it it's yeah. it, it may give people the impression that this is the final count. If they read it off the Novus today, mm. that it's been approved since January and stuff. Well, well, some parts have been. Right, we did it for I understand. The end of the last I, I understand, day. but it, it it doesn't qualify. I'm just suggesting pull that off until we get to, until we finally do it. Okay. Yeah. Just a Dr. thought. Um, if we're commenting on other aspects, um, <laughs> I started. It, I, so. Yeah, you started it. <laughs> I'm concerned about the parent, the kindergarten parents, um, especially those who are working and who aren't necessarily expecting 
half days or no school day for their kindergarten students during that first week. Yeah. And I'm wondering, first, are we making sure that they all know what's coming? And second, are we <coughs> to arrange any help for them, like with the after school programs or anything for those that time when the kids are not in school? Because you know, it sounds like they've got multiple hours when otherwise they would, you would think that they were there. Yeah. Well, the answer about notification, yes. And one of the, <coughs> the nice things that is happening with our new registration process and software that we have, we have the emails for every kindergarten parent, sometimes multiple emails. <laughs> and so we have a listserv, and we've, I've actually gone out <coughs> just with information to kindergarten parents a, a couple times already. Mm -hmm. So that is happening. They also, disc we, have, we have the first introductory meeting on the same day for all elementary schools. It was discussed then. Mm -hmm. We're having meetings at each school mm -hmm. for visits, and now we're going to have screening, and it's discussed then. Okay. They're really being saturated with mm -hmm. this. I will say that uh, we haven't looked at the after school programming because this is the first time we actually have had school in the first week. This, yeah. mm -hmm. they, um, it could be considered a positive for parents because they will have two of those days that week with their child in school, which in previous years they would have had no days that week. But they may not know that. I mean, oh, you know, they, they, if they didn't have a kindergarten student before, <laughs> they may have just thought that the kids oh, just come. I see what you mean. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> right. They, so, true. Anyway. That, that's, that's true. So, um, it's something I can ask the after school programs if they could. The only issue is that the after school programs are after school programs. Yeah. They don't run simultaneously yeah. to our, our, our school day. Yeah. Anyone else? Yeah, Mr. Sifton. Yeah, just on the other note, in terms of major uh, events happening, um, if we have, say, college night and the community ad and a school committee all in this building <laughs> in the same day. Um, we can't park. It, it's just uh, traffic hell, and you, you can't park within 10 blocks of the school. So another reason, even if it's something that we don't care about, I don't have a college-age kid, but boy, if there's college night on a school committee night, uh, you know, some may, you know, please pay special attention to, uh, to the high school headmaster uh, on his use of the calendar and facility use on school committee. We, we, just, we do have to alert them more because they, they live in their world of high yeah, school. Right. They're not looking to see when you're meeting. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, on a note, that was, that was, was probably a high, it was, it was even the attendance, the uh, participation was even more than the previous year. It was a lot of people came. Yeah, and <laughs> if we have a hot topic on the agenda where we have people want to come, we're going to be talking about some important stuff. We're going to be, you know, closing out citizens from participating in our meeting as well. Good right. point. Right. Mm -hmm. Yep. That's right. Mm -hmm. Okay. So are we ready to? We're not voting on anything. Uh, so uh, first no. read. Mm -hmm. um, on the amendments. Oh, we're, well, we we need to vote on the amendments, right? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Sorry about that. Okay. So uh, all those in favor of the amendment of these amendments? Did we yes. vote on? Aye. 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 What? Aye. We did I thought we had. On it. Did we? Yeah. I, I thought we had. Okay, we that's, yeah, that's okay. what I thought. <laughs> okay, so we're not voting on the calendar, though, yet, because it's first read. Right. Right. Um, so we're going time. back. Yeah, I'll June put, 9th we'll put, is going to be our second read, and that will be it. That will mm -hmm. be our calendar. Mm -hmm. um, and I know uh, policy is meeting before then, so there might be some discussion about school committee meeting structures as well. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, uh, superintendent's report. Yep. Two big announcements. Of course, I got the press release out today, so I think it saturated the town with the media and parents and staff, so all, everyone knows that yesterday the uh, Massachusetts School Building Authority Board of Directors voted unanimously to invite Arlington High School into the eligibility period. That's the formal part of the vote. What, what's happening is that we're being invited to commence the eligibility period. We've been in the eligibility, but sort of in a limbo uh, for the last few months. And the reason they did that, just so people understand, it w they accepted more people this year into the program 
more schools. And they have school more schools. They have, uh, 26. They've never gone that, they've never invited that many at the same time. Well, as you can see from the documentation that's required during this period of time, they have to stagger it themselves or they're not, they're not going to be able to deal with the volume of uh, work and the feedback that has to go on during this process. Mm -hmm. But it's very exciting. This is, it doesn't mean that there's not other steps along the way, and there are. Uh, just because you get into the eligibility period doesn't mean you get go to the next stage. Though I will say that their, if you want to say well, retention rate, their retention rate's really high because they work with you. They want you to be successful as well. And usually there's some reason beyond anybody's control of it could be funding, uh, and usually it is funding, where a, a town would have to stop. But that is really actually more rare. So this is a process we're going to go through with MSBA. Um, the first, so during this first period of time, there's a lot of documentation that needs to be given to MSBA, and adhere. We have to adhere to the schedule. The dates I, I put in your a novice, what the deliverables are during this period of time. These number of days out, these commence on June 8th. <clears throat> so right now, we're invited, but we can do some, we're doing some work already. But you can't <coughs> go beyond those dates. You can submit them earlier. You can even submit some of these earlier and in, in quickly. Mm -hmm. But you can't go beyond those dates. And so that's, it's, it's very well laid out. The, um, the compliance cert certification, that, that one's not a particularly time-consuming one. There's going to be a lot of thought given to a building committee. But having said that, there are prescribed positions that MSBA requires. In fact, the form that I have to fill out uh, has the names of those positions. You have to somebody who is certified in procurement. And what? I'm just oh. figuring out nine months from now. Oh. Oh. The, the, where the, the local vote has to take place. I'm sorry. The vote's taking place in June. June 14th. The, this is the vote for the feasibility study. It's that, okay, yeah, so that's all we need. it wasn't for the big money. No. It's not oh. for the big oh, money. Oh, okay, fine. Oh. Okay. It's taking no. place six okay. days in. Got it. Okay. Oh, yeah. cool. No, no, no. The, the, Dr. Bodie, when you say June 8th is the day it commences, do you mean that's that's the day that the clock starts ticking and we count Precisely 30 days the, from then? Yes. And, and all, okay. Yes, that's the day the clock starts ticking. Okay. Yeah. Exactly. So we will be having some discussions and we probably should have some discussions at an upcoming meeting on, on the building committee. And uh, it's not a particularly large committee and it's very prescribed. Uh, one of the things that we, we can add on a couple of positions and um, we did that with Thompson. We added on a parent representative uh, to that committee. Um, and it, we did not add on a teacher. I don't think we added on a teacher, no. But we had, a, we, we had everything that was prescribed, in it, and then uh, we had a parent representative. Is there so, any prescription for community members, parents, or teachers? Or is that not part of the prescribed positions? They're not those part are add -ons. of the Those are add-ons. They're not. Now, it's possible that you can get two firsts that, you know, that might be a parent who, who fulfills the, the engineering requirement. Mm -hmm. Right. So that could happen. What we found with the Thompson Building Committee that a number of members of the Permanent Town Building Committee fit some of those descriptions. And it, and it worked out well uh, to have working very closely with mm -hmm. that committee. Mm -hmm. Now, they may not be as eager to join this because <coughs> Talk about a lot on our plate. We, we have Stratton <laughs> next year as we're working through this. We potentially will have an addition onto Thompson. We're going to have, we're going to have sort of simultaneously to the Thompson, the renovation of Gibbs. Mm -hmm. And meanwhile, we're going to be working on this huge project, mm -hmm. which is going to be significant. Oh, come on. So, so it's huge. It's it's a it's a big. And the the building committee for the Thompson and the Gibbs is the permanent town building committee. Yes. Yes. So Stratton, 
Thompson and Gibbs will all be overseen by Permanent Town Building Committee. So they have a lot that they're going to be doing too. Yeah. That's different from this. <coughs> That's different from this. And that is different from this. Right. Um, even though they recognize that, yes, Arlington, and actually not all communities have these permanent building committees. Yes. We're, quite, we're, we're somewhat unique. <coughs> they have a very prescribed layout of what the committee needs to be. For example, I have to be on it, mm -hmm. or, or my designee, the principal of the building, a school committee member, mm -hmm. um, the town manager or his designee, that kind of thing. So it's very prescribed. Mm -hmm. and, uh, but it is helpful to have people who fit the, the, different, uh, the different descriptors. And by the way, it's, I can give you a copy of what the form looks like mm -hmm. so you know. Mm -hmm. I'll, I'll, get that, yeah, I'll get, send that over to you. So that we will be working on. Then there's the educational profile questionnaire. This isn't the part that's the vision of the school and how, you know, you heard tonight from our director of mathematics and, and science. And, and first of all, I, I have to say that I think people who are listening understand what terrific leadership we have in these <coughs> curricular areas. And that is enormously important for movement of a school district um, and I think Mr. Cardin made a, an interesting point that you know s you know sometimes you might have to balance off the the, the kind of uh, leadership and also coaching and and maybe have class sizes creep up a bit but mm -hmm. the benefit is so terrific and um, so at any rate they're going to be very much involved in this as well because Take science, for example. We need to know what a flexible science lab would be. We need to know really how many labs we have. Um, and just really, are we, we, do we want our labs to be configured both for physics and chemistry? But then now you heard about all the capstone classes. Mm -hmm. So what will be the design? Will we use the model design? And, and actually, how many do we need? Uh, we clearly do not have enough right now. Mm -hmm. let alone size. Mm -hmm. I think our science labs right now are at almost 100% utilization. Mm -hmm. Well, that's not, that's not even, it's really hard to schedule, and sometimes they have to hand schedule just to make sure it happens. Um, but at any rate, those are things that we'll be looking at. Should science and math be adjacent? despite what Mr. Weathers was saying about <laughs> having science being at the pinnacle and in the center of everything, maybe that's not the best way. How should we have our maker spaces? How, where should our computer science be? Our CAD courses? There's just a lot of adjacency and philosophy issues that are going to have to really be, yeah. how many small group sizes do we have? How do, how do we want to deal with blended learning in the building? The list goes on and on. What? It's time to start visiting some schools. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yes, 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 yes. <laughs> Get yes. some ideas. We are. We're, we definitely will. Is, That'll be fun. Yeah. Is, yeah. is there anything still in you buy one of their, their already built schools or yeah. the cookie cutter? Yeah. The models? Okay. Um, the, the school districts that use the models have land. Mm. Okay. Uh, Thank you. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah, land without anything already on it. Right? <laughs> land without so anything we, we on it, and you build stars. There are no, there are no vertical models. Maybe yeah. cows, you know. No. Yeah. Thank no. you. Wow. Mr. Carden. Yeah, I, I wanted to note the, the, the required positions, are, there's 11. Yeah. So in, unless you get a twofer, the committee has to be at least 11 people. Yeah. Belmont just announced their committee has 15 people. So mm -hmm. it can be a sizable committee, yeah. especially mm -hmm. for a project of this magnitude. Yeah, right. And, and you also have to, yeah, 15 would be a good, a workable committee. You get much bigger than that. But even having said that, sometimes people can't always attend. Mm -hmm. And um, so that becomes an issue. And given the length of time of this commitment, yeah. I think that there's going to be transitions on the committee over time uh, because most people aren't going to think that a five or six year commitment is huge. And the, the Thompson Building Committee actually met toward the very end, even after Thompson had been built, because we, we had to close up the project too. So mm -hmm. it's really a six year commitment. 
that's not it's probably not going to happen so they'll have to be having a committee that's a little bit larger mm -hmm. is an advantage because you might have sort of stag uh, something that's more staggered as you go forward you, ne you need some institutional history in terms of the discussions that go on because um, you make you do a lot of work at each one of the meetings so that's what we're going to do, and then the enrollment, the, the part that's going to be one of the most important besides the vote in June, mm -hmm. probably the most important thing in this list of deliverables is enrollment. Mm -hmm. yeah. That is where um, we, we need to really, I, I, I know this is going to be an issue, but uh, can we actually as a community have the evidence of Thompson? Mm -hmm. The calculator that they used mm -hmm. didn't really predict. And I just got, I'll actually give you a copy of it, but I, I was just shaking my head. We got NESDEC's um, um, predictions for us, and they're, they're so far off and so low, mm -hmm. it's, they're not even accurate for this year. Mm -hmm. So I know this is going to be a big issue because, first of all, the size of the building, the reimbursement you get, um, is really related to that number. Uh, Mr. Slickman had something. Yeah, I, I think the, the two things we have to go by. One, I think the, the, the McKibben report is really a high quality uh, yeah. report that the, the state should look at seriously. Mm -hmm. And I'm pretty comfortable with the numbers going forward, especially because, at least in the near term, we know who's in the system now and we know what we're projecting in the elementary and how it will flow. So high schools are usually easier to predict than elementaries. The second thing is, mm -hmm. is that, you know, when, it, when I think about planning this building out, uh, we're, not <coughs> excuse me, we're not just planning it out for our opening date in 2020 or 2021 or whenever we, we, we were able to finish this. We're going to have this building as the heart and soul of our operation for the next 50 years. And you know, with a with a STEM orientation going forward, uh, we're in a technological society in a high tech town. So, it, you know, it would behoove us to get somebody who's really got a tech savvy and, and is got that crystal ball to be playing yeah. on this committee as well to figure out, yeah, you know, what are we going to need in 20 years to 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 have a facility that will meet our meet our needs. Right. In fact, I have a recommendation on that. Mm -hmm. um, I, I recently uh, went to hear um, Barb Burden. Here was the who, who was the person who founded High Tech mm -hmm. um, High Hi. School mm -hmm. in, in in California, mm -hmm. and um, it was it was a fascinating uh, presentation. And then I spoke with them after because that's one of my big concerns is that. Mm -hmm. Un, you know, an elementary is an elementary. The high school, is, this is a really mm -hmm. uh, different situation. How, how do we get the building to match our, our vision and our curriculum mm -hmm. with an eye to 10 years out, mm -hmm. 20 years out? What, what, what should we be thinking about? And an architect, while they might have some very creative ideas how to create the space, they first have to know what kind of space you want. Mm -hmm. And so I think that in this project, we're going to need to get some consultants along that line. Mm -hmm. And so even though this can be this building committee, I would like to have much more reach out mm -hmm. in terms of yeah. getting ideas on this. Mr. Mm -hmm. Hainer. Also, we as a committee have a problem with the town. We have town offices in this building which are not either deciding are they going to stay. Right. If they do, we own it 100% mm -hmm. in this thing. Uh, the, the whole sixth floor is another one of those places, and uh, Monotomy Preschool. So a Preschool, they probably will reimburse. Okay, they're changing, okay. Their they're changing their mind. Oh, That's right. great. Yeah. That's great to know. Mm -hmm. But the, the other aspects of that, and I mean, with all the uh, added wonderful open space that we have in this town, uh, we're going. if the decision is made, does the town want to buy space in this building 100%? If the answer is no, where, where does everybody go? Mm -hmm. I mean, we have our committed spaces that we need, but there's also town spaces down mm -hmm. on the first floor and other. So that's sitting on the outside of this consideration. But when we decide to what kind of building do we want, mm -hmm. we mm -hmm. got to 
That's a parallel yeah. question. Those, those are lots of, lots of those questions. Yeah, yeah. Well, lots of questions. Mm. Mm -hmm. I mean, let, let's say that we look at the, the space we have when we move uh, the sixth floor operation and the folks at downstairs, uh, the town office is out, and take the space that maybe ACA is going to take over at the uh, central school and flip that out because it would be better for them to be tied with us and we get a performing arts center. Or maybe the town wants to build a parking garage in the oh. back of our area that we <coughs> our, our kids would pay for and people who work for the town or work downtown would, would use as well uh, as, as a revenue basis. So lots of performing arts center, lots of things Senior we can play with. I'm dreaming. Yeah, yeah. Dream big. So the question I have is, so in the uh, educational profile questionnaire, which is a 90-day period that commences on June 8th, what is it that we have to, we have to answer all the questions about what we're going to do? Uh, no, 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 no. no. Th this is more, no, no, but we have to have that before feasi during the feasibility. Right, that's what I mean. No, this is a questionnaire about our programs. It's more of a nuts and bolts Okay, kind so it's not, question. it's not, this is what we're going to do in technology. No, 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 no. no. Okay, okay, no. Okay. Okay, that's what I wanted to clarify. So I have, a, I have a question. I know that we're not allowed to do our, the feasibility until we get the go-ahead from them. We have um, to get a formal vote from the board to go to, ahead. To go ahead, um, and I know that that formal vote is would currently be scheduled a year from now. Is there any? Did you get a sense if we could move it up? If we did oh, all the yeah. other things earlier. They said if you finish this all in a month, you could do it. Okay, great, awesome. That's good. Get to work. Yeah, great. <laughs> but realistically, so we're, we're going to build a high school in 13 months, like the Empire State Building. Yeah, it's yeah. kind of next yeah. week. Well, so, I, I, I clearly like to make it faster. Yeah. So I mean, so that was my question: is what is a lot of this going to hit over the summer? So what is your your plan to to do all this and uh, I did want to note that there, there were three schools that were approved in January that moved into feasibility study at this, at this last meeting. Yeah. Their mm -hmm. elementary schools are much simpler, but you, you can move along you much can. quicker than, mm -hmm. than the half a year. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's great. Day. Absolutely. That's great. And, and the sooner we, there's no point in taking this part out longer than it needs to be because honestly, I think the feasibility part is going to take longer than, yeah. So I, the, we're 12 month employees, we'll be around doing it. Mo yeah. Most of this stuff is, is administrative kind right. of. Um, uh, Ruth Bennett, who is the director of facilities for the town, went with us to MSBA because she wanted to hear what, you know, what we needed to do. And um, so they have, a, they have forms online that they're, we're now gonna be opening up that we couldn't before. And but she's known about this for a couple months, and so they've already been starting to gather the information. It's an, in some ways, that's in terms of lengthy report, that's the most lengthy on this one because you have to give a history of all of your maintenance right. for this she's school. New. Well, Mark Miano, fortunately, is a walking encyclopedia of everything that's been done. Excellent. And who did it, <laughs> when it was done, is amazing. So we're gonna have to we're gonna have to channel his do a download and all of that he did the thompson one too so she's not going to do it by herself but it's a long report so, so I, I would say oh sorry i jumped in. the real important thing in this whole process is is the, is the enrollment it's yes. enrollment so, yeah, this I mean, is number the, one in this we went through this with the thompson and uh you know we had a good discussion with them and they predicted 330 we predicted only 420 i think right. back then so we we were in, we were lower so i i think you know, I would just sort of keep the committee informed of all the dialogue with the MSBA yes. on, the, on the enrollment, on the enrollment especially, because I think we, you know, we want to make sure we get it right. Yeah. I know, and it's, it's, it's going to be a challenge. I would like to have Dr. McKibben do an update this summer because, for example, we're going to be over 500 in next year's kindergarten class already. <laughs> this is May. Right. Um, because so, you're talking about because 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 basically the, the case that needs to be made to the MSBA is that we really need a 2,000 person high school capacity for 2,500 right, yes. per grade. Right. See, his numbers were in the 1600s, yeah. but I think that is going to be too low. Right, that's what I mean. Because yeah. you're keeping you're 500, 500, 500, that's a 2,000. Yeah. I, I think we have got escalated at least a couple hundred. And we have yeah. building projects that may be built in town. We got to emphasize yeah. that. I mean, mm -hmm. so that's yeah. that's <laughs> that's the real debate that is the real debate of this first module you've yes. got it right yeah mm -hmm. so what 
Dr. Osnampi. What's meant by the online enrollment projection and enrollment certification executed? The, the online enrollment projections? Mm -hmm. and, and the second thing after that, enrollment certification executed. Well, once you come to an agreement, that's the number you work on going forward. So the first one, the online enrollment projection, that's the number that we have to, I mean, that, that's us picking our number? Well, that's the number that we're going to have to give evidence for why we think that should be that number. And certainly, they already have them, both McKibben reports. And um, I, I think that I'm going to look for other ways of get, providing evidence and maybe it will, it, what might be included is if Dr. McKibben could do another report toward August mm -hmm. as to where we are. Um, because all these things have their ripple effect going, mm -hmm. going forward. Well, you know, th so they, we put in our numbers, then they come back to us, then they say, no, your projections are wrong. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Then we remind them that no, 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 no. We go show no. them the Thompson let's, edition. Let's remember what happened in Thompson. Let's yeah. remember. Let's yeah. remember 2008, 9, 10. Yeah, yeah. And then it goes back and forth. Yeah, and it goes and back and forth. And we're sitting but, there with them. Did you come to that meeting? I can't. Yeah, yeah go back. No, no, no. And then, no, no, no. But this is the first number. This, this is where we give them our first number. Yeah. And then but the, but then once number. it's certified, right? that's it. Then yeah, that's then the we size of the building. So once we get to that next part, which yeah, says well, that's, that's enrollment trying. certification executed, yeah. mm -hmm. that is the operative so, number going forward. Okay. And that so, is a really big deal. So just to put it in timing, I checked on dates. So we have to have, our, that first one's got to be by September 6th. Yeah. The second one where it's finalized is December 5th. Um, this year well that's that's between us and them so they're the, they're pushing that date that that 180 day out thing mm -hmm. once we submit then we're back and forth with them between the 90th day and the right. 180th day right which right. negotiation I'm saying that yes. yeah but I'm Dates saying that that's when that's when it's finalized right yeah, yeah. yeah. Or, before. yeah. or before or before but yeah. but that that's that's yeah. the I'm saying that's the window that we have to work out our numbers yeah that's yeah. correct so uh, we have 90 days to really get our act together on the number, and I think the school committee's role here is to really just kind of come support, uh, support yep. the superintendent and make sure we get the right number, because then you get into the same situation we got into. And more card on the right. 14th. And I just wanted to mention, this was uh, something supposed to be under um, new agenda items for next time, but, but to say that oh, we need to next time talk about um, what procedure we are going to do to solicit um, building committee members from the community and how we're going to evaluate that. So as, as Dr. Bodie mentioned, this there may very well be community members who have the kind of expertise that we need, right. that we can't necessarily rely on the permanent town building to do them all. So, yeah. so we want to figure out how do we solicit those members and um, how do we make that decision? And then third, we need to talk about who on the school committee really wants to be on this committee knowing that it's going to take six years <laughs> so I, I <laughs> so i'm not i'm not we don't discuss it now just this is this is what one of the agenda items for the next meeting and i know uh, mr Cardin had actually um mentioned that this was a good thing to talk about for next meeting and i think it, it is yes well, the town manager and i are meeting next week to talk about that topic that as well okay great yeah awesome. I, was, I was gonna say yeah. the, the legal procedure for appointing who have to forming the committee is unclear unclear He's right. looking into that okay. um and and i guess we need to negotiate what our role is going to be right so obviously we'll select our member whether we select the parent or the superintendent selects the parent that or right. the town manager does that's still so that's what we need to talk about yeah okay good so we'll right. uh, dr Wade and i will we're not talk a little and I'm sorry, we're not discussing we the who as much we're not as we're, discussing. We're, uh, the procedure. We're, we're going to talk the procedure. about the procedure. Yeah, so hopefully we'll get clarity on that at our next meeting. Mm -hmm. yeah, at the procedure. Um, but if there is a school committee member who's really interested in being on this committee, uh, I know I, I, I got some preliminary sense a few months ago, but, but you should let me know if you're really interested. Will do. <clears throat> no, you shouldn't appoint somebody else. You should be. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Sounds good to me. And I know we have something else to do for some report. Um, report. We Are do. We do. Yeah. This one is a fairly meaty one to do, but there's a couple quick things. Um, speaking, as we were talking about buildings, um, 
the the permanent town building committee has selected for a designer for the Thompson addition uh, that is going to be HMFH uh, there were a couple of projects but the uh, obviously the knowledge of the building since they mm -hmm. built it was a, a deciding factor so we have the as part of a design proposal you have to give a design so we've already had a, a preliminary design uh, the architect actually two architects from HMFH have met with uh, principal Donato and myself to get some other suggestions so now they're going they're taking a new draft and so we've inviting parents next to the first June 1st to come to an evening uh, meeting it's, uh, that's all been um, sent out to parents so that they can hear some of the issues and ask questions see the design get some feedback and then principal Donato is working on developing an advisory committee which would be a small committee which is what we did with Stratton once the building part was mm -hmm. turned over to permanent town building actually went to capital then to permanent town building but we kept an advisory committee turned out it wasn't the same people that was on, the originally on the building committee and they're very different and, I, and I've said this to some of the parents with the Stratton project there was a lot of work that had to be done in deciding what was parity mm -hmm. and that took surveys focus groups discussions mm -hmm. and that was handled by the building committee we don't need a building committee for Thompson in that sense because it's an addition and permanent town building is going to do it what we need is some a, a small committee to be advisory along the way when you know some issues come up that permanent town building would not address or would prefer not to in fact and I'm sure the as their pile of work grows they'll be just as happy to have some taken off will you have Ms. Donato filling the similar role that uh, Mr. Hanna does during this Mr. Hainer? Mr. Hanna. Mr. Hanna. Hanna. Yes, she'll be on it. Mr. Hainer is going to be there, but that's mm -hmm. the same. Yes. I, I mean, yeah, I, I find it, I personally find him uh, really an important uh, person being there asking data when members of the permanent town building committee ask an educational or, or a question about the building. He's, he's right there and he's been very good with that. So yeah. I, I, I see Ms. Donato doing this, a similar thing. Uh, yes, she, she's prepared to do that. Great. Yes. Thank you. Um, so that's going and you all will be welcome I'll send it by email the time mm -hmm. um, so then that will be the meeting and then there'll be a follow-up meeting later in June coming back to the smaller committee now to show them what the the design is because here our situation with Thompson is this assuming a positive vote in June on the override we need to be re ready to go out to bid by the end of August early September <clears throat> the process for choosing the designer took longer than people anticipated <clears throat> so we're a little behind schedule this process was supposed to have started a couple weeks ago it's just the way it is and so we're under the gun they we have to have the final design ready uh, that everybody agree on what the design is going to be by the end of June so they can now do the the next piece the schematics and all of and get the bid documents ready and all of that um, for the for early early September and then we have to have a special town meeting if we have a successful override mm -hmm. to appropriate the money and once the money is appropriated then we can actually award the bids and get going but we need to be able to get going no later than November 1st that's even pushing it would be better if a little bit earlier so we're on a tight time frame there too and um, so there's a lot going on on that on that one I mean that alone if we did, <laughs> you think about it that alone could have been just the work of next year but we've got all of these going on simultaneously all right um, so the last thing I want to bring up and by the way one last the art show tonight you heard the art here but the art show at the town hall the last couple of weeks mm -hmm. has been fantastic so kudos to all of our art teachers and um, to to director Ardito because it's 
it's just been superb. And I really like the fact of how public these uh, exhibits are so the people come out. Mm -hmm. Apparently, I got there late, so did Mr. Spiegel, but we got there around 5.30 and there already had been, he said, a good thing you came now because it was packed. Mm. So a lot of people came out. All right. So every, every other year, we do a youth risk behavior survey. And the middle school and the high school have been in alternate years. The, the, the middle school one from last year is on our website. And we will be putting on our website tomorrow the full report. But I wanted to discuss it this evening first before we actually just put it on, on the website. And you ha what you have here, and this is from Ivy LaPlante. She, uh, well, actually, she is our conduit to the person who actually does the analysis. She doesn't do it. We, we, we hire someone to do a full analysis every, every time we do this survey and to, find, and to look at what the trends are in different categories. And, you know, I'm not going to go through every single category. First of all, on personal safety and violence, which is having fights or drinking alcohol, there's really pretty much the same. Now, I'm not saying that the same is good. I'm just saying that it's been pretty much the same from the one in 2013. Um, one that's a little concerning in that, though, still remains that 14% of students report they have ever been verbally or emotionally abused by someone they dated. It was 15% in 2013, so we're not seeing that budge even though we've done programs and um, talked about it in different, different forums within the school, and there's certainly the leadership councils, and it just, there's been a lot of ways we've addressed this, but it's a, it's a stubborn number, and that's really concerning. That's a, I think that's a big percentage. Now, so it's a, it's a, it's a call for some more action, for sure. But I think the one that I want to talk a little bit most about tonight is the social and emotional health, because I see some trends here that are concerning. And to your question, Mr. Hayner, about the courses students are taking, it, is that the source of stress? I think what we'd love to be able to get down in here a little bit more deeply into this um, is what is the source of stress? Because so 41% of our students report feeling that they are under too much stress. That's almost, 41% is a very high percentage. In the, and in the previous two surveys, we were in the 30s, and we thought those were high. So we're seeing, a, we're seeing an, an escalation. And, and I think that that's something that we need to look at. Um, we really need to focus on advising kids to get a better, if, if it's really courses, get a better balance of AP and honors. There's a certain amount level of work in those courses you can't reduce because then you've lost the rigor of the course. So what we need to do is to have it be a, a more balanced portfolio of courses that they take. But I'm not sure that's the entire reason either. And, and uh, we're focusing on that, but I'm not sure that's it. Trainer. Would it be worth having a more in-depth survey, yes. investigation? Yes. I, I, I think that whatever mm -hmm. the cost of that is definitely beneficial to find out rather than try to, no offense, I, I don't mean to guess or assume no, right. that, that it's AP or yeah. homework. Yeah. I mean, the students responded to homework. Some responded to parental pressure. It can be a combination. I, I, I think it's so important to find out and whatever it takes to find it out. And I, 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 don't, I don't want to speak for everybody, but I think it's something we need to do. Yeah, Dr. Yeah. I wanted to chime in on what Mr. Hayner is saying that you know, some of it may be stress because homework assignments are unclear mm -hmm. or you know, it, mm -hmm. it may not just be fulfilling the obligations. It may be stuff which could be easily changed. Um, mm -hmm. And it would be helpful to find that out. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Ms. Starks? I just also wonder, I mean, what do uh, kids, what else do they have to be stressed about? Mm -hmm. Of course, if you ask me if I'm stressed and the things I have are school and my parents, yes, they stress me out. Mm -hmm. But <laughs> what else? I mean, I don't, like, I, I guess my part of my problem with the question always is, 
of course school stresses them out. But stress is not always bad, right? So stress is also something that's a motivator, and stress is something that makes us do stuff. And, you know, so I have a hard time teasing out when kids say, mm -hmm. I'm stressed about school. I'm mm -hmm. like, okay, yes. Yep. You know what? Yep. We, you should be. That's part of your job. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. My job stresses me too. Mm -hmm. that's, but I want to be working. That's, mm -hmm. the, yep. that's what I'm supposed to be doing. Yep. And that should give me some stress. But I want to know, I, I would like us to figure out if it's an unhealthy stress, mm -hmm. if it's a, you know, like I, I, I feel like, you know, like when we first started talking about bullying and all of a sudden everything was bullying and then we went, no, 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 no. Right. let's define it. So I, I really want to have a discussion about stress because of course they're stressed about school. Mm -hmm. It's right. one of the things they do. It's part of their job. Right. So, mm -hmm. and not saying that it's not important. It absolutely is. And the fact that the numbers on the rise they're more aware of it. Yes, that it could is be, something it could that gives be them stress. Them. But I don't know. I, I want to understand better how badly that stress is. You know, that, yeah. I guess that's, that's what's something I wish we could tease out of this a little bit Mr. more. Hainer. Next element down yes. had yeah, a minor a tick up. I agree with Ms. Starks. It's important for us to know. But you and I can have the same elements of causing stress. You're able to deal with it with support and stuff outside of the school. I may not have that support at home. So once we find out yeah. where yeah. it is, what can we do to help? You say, exactly. I'm fine. I got my mom and dad. I got whatever. Right, right. I right. got nothing. So we need to find out yeah. what it is yeah. and, and where it is. Right. But that right. last <coughs> next element down scares the living daylights yeah. out of me. May I make, make yeah. more comment? Yeah. Yeah. Because yeah. you look at the next percentages under this issue of stress. 58% yep. is due to homework or academic school day. 26% high parental ex expectations. Now, if you just assume that those are the only two, we're still missing a chunk, right. <laughs> you know, what it is. Do so that's know, an issue. Do, you know, do we know what they were in previous years, or were they not broken down that way? It, it wasn't broken they down that way. Down. But when you get down to, um, you get 10% of our students yeah. feeling hopeless yeah. or discouraged. Now, we don't have a comparison. But in the next one, we're talking about self-esteem and fitting in. 16% worry that they are not good at anything most of the time or always. Yeah, that's a big That's job. up one from 12%. That's one out of six. That's, that's, six. that's concerning. That is very concerning. Mm -hmm. And it was up from 10% the year before, yeah. the, the, the survey before. Okay. Do we know what the margin of error is on these she surveys she from year to year? I don't know, but that's a very good yeah. question. Yeah. I, I, like to know that. About 10%. I can ask it. Well, you just do a statistical analysis. Yeah. They should have a number. Just yeah. yeah. There should be a number. Well, yeah. One of the things that this may be, well, I, I, I'm going to find that out for you, but also one of the things I wanted you to be aware of is that the Middlesex superintendents, we've now coalesced as a group. One of the things we're thinking about doing is getting our districts on the same cycle um, so that. When you, when you see these, you can compare to what your responses are before, um, and, and they also you can get it compared to the state. But it would be very interesting for us to be looking at our contiguous mm -hmm. peer communities to see mm -hmm. you know, where we are relative to that. So that might mean that next year, because we're, we're off cycle, mm -hmm. compare, but we're going to talk about who's the most off cycle, because maybe they're the, the community that will get back in. But, um, we may have to do this again. Mm. And we also may think about whether we do shorter versions. I've talked with Ivy LaPlante and they're working, there's a shorter version out. But these are all questions that we'll be looking at. But at any rate, if you go down to the next one, uh, this is also a trend that it seems pretty stable. Was, it was self-harm, 19% report hurting themselves on purpose. Uh, that, that's just huge in my mind. Excuse me. And, and I have to say mm -hmm. that, yes, we are seeing that. I mean, that we have evidence of that from our nurses, but it remains somewhat stubborn from the last couple of years. But that's, that's pretty high. We're seeing an, a, a sort of an uptick from 13 on um, seriously considered attempting suicide. I mean, 14% is a lot of students to be thinking about that. Uh, but again, it's staying pretty much the same s since 2011. So the, the kind of conversations we've been having about stress and 
so creating a <clears throat> more po even more positive social uh, social emotional cultures in our building is is something that we've recognized. It's something that we have a committee that's going to do it, a grant to help us fund some of the work this summer. But we have seen this, and we've talked about it at this table. The and is and I, I would like to be able to say it was only high school, but it is not. And we've had we've even had students at the elementary level have to go to the hospital in an ambulance for anxiety. Mm -hmm. So you know this is something that's very serious, and we're taking it very seriously, and tr and um, looking at all that we can do. Uh, but to your point, there's a certain level of stress that's in schools. I mean, right. that that exists. But how do we get help our 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 children learn how to cope mm -hmm. and put all of that in perspective? Mm -hmm. right. That's really the cope. That's really the skills we need to teach. Right. So, so actually, um, you've talked about that, that there is going to be sort of a major initiative to look at this. Can you just say yes. a little bit more about well, what, what, uh, what the plan uh, is in the coming you, year? Pull you into this because yeah. we're working. Yeah. We have a committee, and, and, be helpful and for Dr. The Chesson to know. was part of the writing of the grant. Right. So there will be a committee that will look at this um, for about four or five days this summer. There are a number of instru instruments that Allison um, Elmer, who is the uh, special education director, has used in her prior district to build um, sort of a profile of where your strengths and your challenges are. And there's a consultant that she's worked with before that she feels would be um, very helpful to work in this process. And from out of that, there will be a planning, you know, they will do that, begin that work this summer. They will do that work all this year. And it's our hope that we will have um, a plan that we will be able to go forward with um, to help get additional funding to, you know, work up over say the next three years on this issue and that doesn't mean that things are going to wait three years right. but that we want to do it very thoughtfully and we're looking for a really cohesive k-12 plan mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. great thanks so so some good news in this <coughs> is the number of students that are have never tried a cigarette is growing to 87 percent miss bouvier will be and the Sanborn Foundation will be very happy on that mm -hmm. on that effort, and 92 percent have not smoked. Uh, the number of students in, with alcohol use is again remaining sort of stubborn on that. Uh, but on the other hand, if you look at it, 42 percent of our students have never, never had a sip of alcohol. Mm -hmm. That's pretty good. Pretty good. Uh, on the other hand, there are students that um, are having more than five drinks in a row, and those are, those are issues we have to look at, too. Um, the, the marijuana use is still remaining somewhat steady. It's 68 percent have never used it, but that means that over 30 percent are using it. <laughs> and it's... And we, and then we have 97 percent of the students report never having used heroin, <laughs> but that means three percent might be. Mm -hmm. I don't know how to to really if that's Change. really true. Um, that's that is interesting. I know. Now another um, uh, statistic in this I think is worth mentioning is that 13 percent of our students report being gay, lesbian, bisexual, or uncertain about their sexuality. And that is um, a, a fairly large percentage that, um, that have students that are dealing with these issues. And by the way, um, I, I want to just say publicly that this, the issues that is being discussed a lot about bathrooms and transgender and locker rooms, it's just a non-issue here mm -hmm. and has been for a while. So we, it's not a, at all an issue. Um, so anyway, those are the main points, and, and as you look over this survey, if there's things that you would like to know more about, I think we could bring in, um, you know, some some people who are very close to some of the some of these areas. Do you feel that you need a motion to go forward to to investigate in depth the area, the the stress area? Okay. Mm -hmm. That will definitely be part of that committee's work this summer. Excellent. Yeah. Excellent. Thank you. Right. So 
we will release this and we will also we'll get the summary out and we'll get the actual um, results on the website tomorrow. So Great. sent to the committee, is there do we want somebody to come in and talk to mm -hmm. us in greater detail about this? No. This I would like to know the that element, that piece of the results and stuff, uh, when we get in there, and mm -hmm. what sort of action you plan on taking from the summer work? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. yes. We'll, there will be a report at the end of the summer. Thank That'd you. Be great. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Dr. Um, yeah. This isn't. I know this survey is packaged already, so I don't know if we can add anything. But one thing, as we've seen these surveys over the years, I wish sometimes that we knew is what day of the week are kids doing some of this stuff? I mean, the ones who do drink or who do smoke or, or whatever. So weekend versus Be, weekend. Yeah, exactly. Is it weekend? Is it the middle of week? Because partly as you're trying to develop some sort of alternative for the kids, it'd be helpful to know what days are we targeting. I mean, yes, most likely it's the weekend, but it'd be helpful to know that. And if it wasn't, then that suggests other answers. So. Mm -hmm. I wanted to add, I know that in the past we've seen a breakdown by gender, um, and I know, I know that certain things like self-harm are higher for girls and for boys, and... Um, well, the complete, the, this, this is just a oh, summary. Oh, so the complete this one has that breakdown? This is a summary. Okay, that, that's available to the public, or... Oh, yeah, I'm going to put everything on the website. Everything, okay. Uh, but I, I know that some of these things are bro uh, broken down by different um, sexes have different things. Okay, okay. and Thanks. that was it. Other than telling you where our kindergarten numbers are. Mm -hmm. okay. Yes. All right, so no it, one then. else can move in over the summer. Well, we're happy to have them. <laughs> if, 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 no, 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 we love everyone. We're happy to have them. <laughs> yeah. All right, that's it my my report tonight. Okay, great. Thanks. Um, so moving on to the consent agenda. Um, all items listed with an asterisk are considered to be routine and will be enacted with one motion. There will be no separate discussion of these items unless a member of the committee so requests, in which event the item will be considered in its normal sequence. Approval of warrant, warrant number 16169, total warrant amount uh, 624,191 and 95 cents, dated May 12th, 2016. Approval of minutes, special school committee meeting, Monday, May 9th, 2016, and regular school committee meeting, May 12th, 2016. Can you so pull, uh, wait, pull, uh, Dr. Alice Nampi, pull you want the pull May 12th minutes, please? Okay, pull May 12th minutes. Anything else? Okay, so um, all those in favor approving the ones not pulled, aye. by saying aye. 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 All opposed? Okay, that's unanimous. Uh, so May 12th. May 12th is what you wanted? I need to abstain. Yes, okay, so. Move to um, approve the regular school committee mi uh, minutes for May 12, 2016. Second. Okay. Um, moved by Mr. Hainer, seconded by Mr. Thielman. All those in favor? Aye. 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 And I um, opposed? And abstentions. Aye. Dr. Allison Abbey is abstaining. Okay, uh, subcommittee and liaison reports. Budget. Um, Dr. Allison Abbey. Budget doesn't have anything to report at this point, do it? No. Yeah. Okay. Community relations, Ms. Starks? Um, we have a meeting planned on Tuesday the 31st from 4.30 to 6 up here. Um, we have three items on our agenda, uh, the calendar survey, the dashboard, and future forums. Great. Uh, district accountability curriculum instruction and assessment. <laughs> Uh, we met yes, yesterday. That, that's <laughs> <it>. <laughs> and I and should if just you say want CIA. Longer, I'll tell you who we met with. We met with the Subcommittee on Cultural Competency of the Superintendent's Diversity Advisory Committee. Uh, and we discussed uh, the presentation that they made last week, and we came up with a motion, <coughs> excuse me, motion asking that we weave into the superintendent's goals. Uh, with regard to uh, cultural competency that we we've been assessing our current situation and uh, and and develop a need statement plan for the future and make it visible on the website I think that once we got into a conversation talking what we were actually doing in the district uh, they, they were impressed but we're not communicating that well and they didn't know this was happening so I, I think by communicating this and making it visible, 
uh, uh, they make the case that uh, people will respond positively to us and think that we're doing great and wonderful things for all of our children in this district. Uh, we're, we'll be meeting again before our next meeting. We'll put out a doodle probably tomorrow. Right. So just a reminder, we have the, um, the goals that we've looked at first, first read, and then we hope to get a second read in the next meeting. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, for uh, facilities, Mr. Thielman. No report. Policies and procedures, Mr. Hayner. We met on May 19th and came up with a uh, beginning list of policies to look at uh, from us, from committee members. We also had a uh, community member come in and talk about a policy on recycling, and we're gonna look at that again. And uh, a parent came in and asked us to look, for cl uh, seek clarification on the, our current homework policy. Mm -hmm. We will be meeting again on May 31st at 6 p.m. Excellent. So. So actually, Mr. Hayner, was, is there something we need to do tonight? about the recycling? Um, there was a request from uh, the person to ask <coughs> to get a consensus uh, from us and have the chair, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, yes. send a letter of support mm -hmm. on the concept mm -hmm. of recycling. Okay, it would so just have no bearing. She, uh, what she, need, she needs it, this, she needs letters of support from different uh, committees, school committee being one, mm -hmm. uh, that recycling is a a good, thing, that a we good thing to do. It, that, it, it has no bearing on our policy or commitment to us. To okay, it's so. a good thing to do, and we support doing this. So okay, yeah. okay. So I, I can so, do that. Uh, okay. Uh, okay. Should we have a motion uh, to okay. ask the chair to write the letter? Sure. Have a motion. Uh, motion by Mr. So Schlickman. Moved. Okay. Um, second, second by Mr. Hayner. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay. <coughs> write that letter. Um. So uh, school enrollment task force, I guess we are done. <laughs> we can cross that one off, right? Or no, we oh, can't. No, no, it's no. still there. No, I'm sorry. We're not done. We're report. just taking a hiatus. I'm sorry. Yes, we are taking a hiatus. Uh, warrant committee. Everybody get paid. <laughs> uh, any school liaison reports? No. No. Okay. Uh, any announcements? Mr. Hayner. I'd like to announce one more time that uh, there will be a Memorial Day program at the town hall at 9 o'clock on Monday. Uh, there will be a speaker, uh, and from there we will uh, go over to the cemetery at the different uh, areas, uh, commemorating uh, s service people from uh, from the Civil War. And at the very end of that will be a uh, ceremony dedicating uh, an area for those that have passed away on war on terrorism from 1990 to the current. Um, and there will be no parade from uh, Walgreens this year. It'll be. It, the, once the program is done at uh, the town hall, we will parade down to the cemetery. Mm. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thanks. Um, I'd also like to mention that there's a Rotary dinner on Monday the 13th, <laughs> where Mr. Hayner is one of the uh, people who is going to be honored. <laughs> Thank you. Yes. Anything else? Announcements? Okay. Uh, future agenda items. We've mentioned one, uh, but Mr. Cardin had another one that he had mentioned. Do you want to? Oh. Yes, so the other item was uh, taking a look at the buffer zones. The buffer zone policy actually does say that on a occasional basis, the superintendent will take a look at the buffer zones and recommend uh, adjustments that may be necessary. As we're seeing with the kindergarten numbers in East Arlington, you know, they're getting so high that you might not even be able to accommodate them with eight classes in East Arlington. So clearly that's one area where there's there's just no flexibility for you to to address that. So I think it, it's a good time to take a look at where the buffer zones are, where they're working, where they're not working. There may be areas such as the current, um, uh, you know, the part, the part along Spy Pond that is a mm -hmm. Bishop Thompson buffer zone that doesn't make any sense anymore because uh, none of those people are gonna be able to go to Thompson, clearly. Um, and then there are other parts where, uh, like in East Arlington, where maybe we can expand the buffer zone uh, to allow for more flexibility. And um, so if we could get something, you know, maybe in the fall as, as a time frame, uh, uh, I don't think that type of adjustment requires a redistricting committee or anything like that. Certainly we need public input. We need to let people know that we're thinking about moving the lines, um, if that's your recommendation. Um, but I, I do think it's something that we should be looking at. It's been, you know, four or five years yeah. since we've, we set those zones. Mm -hmm. 
So our next meeting, we'll have a short discussion about how we think we'd like to handle it for the coming year. And, um, but, but it sounds like the process wouldn't begin until the fall. But we'll, we'll let's, let's have a quick discussion about how, how we want to handle it. Yeah. Yes, Mr. So Jeff. if the uh, uh, debt exclusion is successful, I think at some point, I don't know if it's, I don't know if it's an agenda item for next week, um, but we've got to have a discussion about how we're going to get, uh, what the process for the Gibbs is going to look like, how we're going to get community input in that. In that. Mm -hmm. how that's going to work and okay. i know we have the thompson yeah High yeah, School. yeah. <laughs> and so <clears throat> um but anyway it, it's it, it's, it, a, it's a future agenda item it may not be next week it may not even be till the fall i don't know but i just want to make sure we don't lose sight of that that's a good, great mm -hmm. thanks for suggesting that uh, my gut is that the fall would be better but right, that's right. my gut so fine i just want to put it out but, there. Yeah, that's th thanks for suggesting that mr hainer since policy is meeting before our next meeting should we look at the buffer zone thing or should we wait till the ninth and decide the procedure so I think potentially that we're thinking about just having a brief discussion on the 9th, but we need math before we can. Yeah, but we, we need we numbers. Not I'm not looking to add any more to of the of table. How it's going to happen? Fine. Does it go to one committee? Do we form another committee? Just have a brief discussion. Well, if you want to take the buffers on the thing, not yet. Should. Not yet. Uh, I'm not looking. I just don't want to come back on the ninth and say, Bill, we thought you did it. No, no. Let's have, let's have a brief discussion Fine. next meeting about That's how good. we want to accomplish this. That's right. Okay. The whole redistricting thing. We'll okay. do it in a half hour. Redistrict the town. Okay. Okay, executive session. That's what. Um, so we are going into well, executive session, mm -hmm. yep. and we won't be returning from executive session. Uh, purpose of executive session is to conduct strategy sessions in preparation for negotiations with union and or non-union personnel or contract negotiations with union and or non-union in which if held in an open meeting may have a detrimental effect to conduct strategy with respect to collective bargaining or litigation in which if held in an open meeting may have a detrimental effect. Collective bargaining may also be discussed uh, to discuss Arlington Education Association Unit C negotiations and to vote to approve the following executive session mission. Those are the two specific things we're gonna be discussing. Um, one on Thursday, January 8th, 2015, Thursday, January 2nd, 2015, Thursday, February 12th, 2015, and Thursday, March 12th, 2015, and Thursday, March 26th, 2015. Uh, so we need to take a vote, roll call vote, right, to go into the executive session? Okay, so Mr. Cardin. Yes. Hi. Yes. 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 So we'll just, yes. Ms. Sarks. Aye. <laughs> Yes. Thielen, and I say yes. So we are now in executive session. session.